But, uh, so we'll start, David, we'll start with you. Well, I um, am chair of the Historical Commission, and uh, I'm somewhat similar. I always look at the staff, and I always look at even other members of the commission as in, in many ways more involved in some of the historical things than, than I, but I have a deep passion for it, and we're trying to move at the commission level on trying to really get some heightened sensitivity to all things history. And obviously that includes NRAC work as well. So. Good morning, my name is Fred Belden. I am an architect with Clearscapes. Uh, we specialize in urban and historic preservation adaptive use work. So I, I work with a lot of the folks that were at the state on a number of projects. My name is Josie Ward and I'm an architectural historian and preservation consultant out of Asheville. Nice. I'm David Bergstein. I'm from Winston-Salem. I'm a historic preservationist. Spent most of my career at Old Salem. It's a record of architecture. We have uh, all bonanza rounds, other parts of the Piedmont. You may know uh, Betsy Pittman Overton. She's from Salem area. She spent a lot of time with the Salem historical group. So anyway, we'll talk at break. <laughs> if I give you a break. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Mary Beth Fitz. I'm a research archaeologist at uh, UNC Chapel Hill in Research Labs of Archaeology. I'm also formerly of the Office of State Archaeology here. This is, is this you, I think this is this your first meeting. meeting. This is your yeah. first meeting. Welcome aboard. Yes, welcome. <laughs> and I am Sean Patch. I'm an archaeologist with New South Associates in Greensboro. It's good to see everyone today. Dr. Johnson. <laughs> Thank you all for being patient with me running in. I'm Valerie Ann Johnson. I'm Dean of Art Sciences and Humanities at Shaw University. Do not go into your office before a meeting. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> and I also serve on the Historical Commission and as chair of the African American Heritage Commission. One other person who's left at our table will start our introduction of the staff. We will start out with you as the head. Uh -huh. Darren Waters, I'm Deputy Secretary of the Office of Archives and History and also the State Historic Preservation Officer. Good to work with this wonderful team. Yeah. Right. We start in the room, Sean. I'm the Senior Environmental Team Survey Coordinator. I'm Sarah Woodard, I'm the Branch Supervisor for Survey National Register. Julie Smith, National Register and Survey Specialist. I'm Mitch Wilds, head of the Restoration Services Branch. I'm Laura Poole. I'm the Historic Preservation Specialist for the Eastern Branch. Megan Sullivan, uh, State Homeowner Tax Credit working here. Oh, well, I will interject here that Megan is our new staffer, and um, we're wonderfully happy to have her on board. Thank you. Justin, I'm the National Register Coordinator of Based here in Raleigh. And I think we had some more. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's been the glue that really got us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got your breakfast up here. And, I have a passes <laughs> and our, our parking passes. Which are fantastic. And to be honest, we sit and we make we make the final decision, but we know who does the work. And we just get to come in a couple times a year and read your comments and what y'all have done. So uh, we appreciate all that you do. Okay, Dr. Waters, I'll, I'll turn it over to you because you may have something right. to tell us about. Yes, well, and I'm going to share this with, uh, with Sarah. But yes, you can see Ramona is not here. This is her first time in 12 years that she's missed this meeting. She's in Charlotte at another meeting. Uh, so if she hates to miss it, uh, she sends her regards to everyone. Um, again, I'll start out by saying, you know, thanking you all for being a part of this committee and the work that you do. It's a lot of work, but as you know, as a historian, I believe it is very, and I know you all share my sentiment here. It is very worthwhile. So I want to thank you all for, for doing this work. Secondly, I want to thank the staff, and I do this at every meeting, so I hope it doesn't get, you know, just seem perfunctory, but I definitely do appreciate the work that the staff here does. Um, I'm amazed at how much they're able to get done. David and uh, 
members of the uh, historical commission, we have been talking about the needs for this staff, especially this division for a while. I was just expressing to David just a few minutes ago, and I'll talk to Sean about this, Sean. So I deeply appreciate the interest that you all have in supporting or finding ways to support uh, advocacy or, or uh, on behalf of the staff. I think that needs to be done. We deeply appreciate you know, the budget that was passed uh, recently, but um, not to be, to say too much, I can say a lot here, um, but I won't. Um, I was not happy about the fact that we didn't get what we really needed for this division. Now, I will say that the, the governor's budget did request more full-time uh, employees for uh, uh, positions for uh, state historic resources, mm -hmm. for the Office of State Archaeology and for SHPO, um, but it was not included. None of those positions were included in the final budget. We're hoping that we can do something about that going forward. There's a real need because the demands on this team, I think, are growing. And the department is deeply committed to, and the staff, and the work they're doing are so committed to expanding the people that we touch across the state. And as that happens, that means that the demands on the team is going to increase. So you need the capacity to be able to meet that demand. Um, there is, a, as you all know, uh, an enormous economic impact from the work that this team does for the state of North Carolina. Um, I was recently reminded of that on the trip that I took earlier this summer um, to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And it was just interesting to see the preservation work that they're doing there. And most people spend most of their time in old San Juan, not in the new parts. They're spending their time there because they want to see the old structures, the things that have been preserved. While I was there, I did visit with our counterparts while I was there, and, and was, it was interesting to see that they're fully staffed, a number of people working in that. They have resources that I think that we need here. And I know some of that comes from the fact that they've had major hurricanes and things there, so we don't want that here. But nevertheless, we need to do, I want to see us do more, the state to do more to support the work of this team because it is, the work that they're doing is very important. So I'll get off of that. Hopefully I didn't get myself in, in, in any trouble saying that, but I want to make sure this team knows that uh, the secretary and and members of his staff are advocating really hard for, for you all and for, for that work. So anything that you can do, you all can do to support that. We deeply appreciate that. Um, I think we're probably going to stop there. But again, just thank this team. Um, I was going to go through some things that Dr. Mona had provided, but I'm going to let Sarah do that. Sarah's going to take those things. That's it. I'll turn it over to you. But thank you for giving me that time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Waters. Um, so since we last met, John Wood in our Eastern office has retired. Uh, we all miss him terribly, but he had an opportunity to retire and um, take his talents to the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office and um, rejoin his wife, Nancy, who had already moved back to Pennsylvania um, several, uh, several years ago. Um, so uh, Megan Sullivan, as Mitch mentioned, has joined us. Um, Megan is a graduate of the uh, preservation program from the College of Charleston and Clemson, and her thesis was a study of barns. So she's a, a vernacular architectural village person. Um, Megan, anything you want to say or add? I um, noticed I'm, I started here in August, so I've only been around for two and a half months here, um, almost. But I'm excited to be in North Carolina again. I went to undergrad here, so. Back. All right. Um, in July, Hannah Beckman Black gave birth to a beautiful baby boy named Ansel, and um, we assume he is watching attentively today. <laughs> uh, he came to staff with you two weeks ago and oh. was really involved with death and a presentation about um, a primitive Baptist church, a regular Baptist church. He's, he's, he's going to be a Baptist scholar. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm also happy to report that our staffing is uh, is pretty full. We are about to make an offer uh, to a candidate for our file room uh, assistant position. And that should be, hopefully, if all y'all stay around, uh, our last hire um, for the foreseeable future. This will be the branch's ninth hire in four years. So we are all fresh with you now. 
thank you all for your willingness to reconvene and sleep online. Splitting the survey reports off onto their own meeting seems like the lesser of the two evils. The other evil was spending an, an extra night here and coming back to here tomorrow. Um, so we decided to break those off. And um, I think you'll really enjoy those. We have three really nice um, survey presentations out of that. And these are, we may have to do this more in 2024 as well as survey products continue to come in from these uh, survey grants that we have going on. Um, uh, the, the bigger picture that Ramona wanted to share is that we have two new highway markers, uh, one for Seaboard native Reverend Nicholas Franklin Roberts, who was uh, president of Shaw, and then also one uh, honoring the human computers who were part of the pioneering African-American female mathematicians for the U.S. space program. Ramona, Secretary Wilson, and Dr. Waters, plus members of our staff and state archaeology, uh, attended the Preservation North Carolina Conference in Durham last week. Dr. Waters gave our um, year in review presentation, and Secretary Wilson made a really lovely presentation about our office's work. Uh, Ramona and Christy Brantley, who's our certified local government coordinator, hosted a listening session for our um, next 10 year statewide preservation plan. We have a, a 10 year um, preservation plan. And that meeting was well attended. And then you should have a flyer in your little collection of papers there with information about taking um, a survey online. It's not, it won't take long, but again, we, have, we need to uh, have some input in that state plan. And finally, the UNC School of Government has completed a statewide historic resilient historic preservation resilience project to foster better preparedness for historic places throughout North Carolina communities. Um, this project was funded through our office using uh, money from our congressional preservation for Hurricane Recovery, Hurricane Florence, and Michael. The School of Government is going to host training workshops for this across the state that's happening in the late fall and early winter, November and December, I believe. Um, if anyone's interested in attending that, just let them uh, know. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. All right, next question. All of you looked over the uh, presentations. Is there anyone who needs to recuse himself on any of the, yes. I will be stepping out for the Walton Street Park and Pool nomination as I prepared it. Is there anyone else? Well, if you, as we get through the presentations, or uh, realize that you do need to recruit yourself, just let me know. Right? Okay. Anything else that we haven't done? You think that? All right. You ready to get to work? We're trying to get all the National Register commitments. Uh, all of you. All of our work, uh, to try to get the national register nominations done before lunch, and then we'll try to break up the study list. I did not ask for uh, approval of the minutes. I'm to approve the minutes uh, from the last meeting. Yes, that's what I'm doing. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I'll move to approve the minutes. Second. 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 All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Right, the minutes are approved. Okay, let's start with our presentation. We'll be starting with the Western Region, and we will vote by region unless there's a reason we need to pull out one of the nominations and discuss it uh, and vote separately. Yeah. yeah. So this is not my presentation. This was put together by Claudia Brown. So I want to say thank you to her for the PowerPoint and the script. And I'm going to be delivering her work today. Uh, completed in 1907 and enlarged several times between the 1930s and early 1960s, Woodlawn Mill is located in Mount Holly in far eastern Gaston County, as shown on the map to the left. <clears throat> On the right, the mill's location is at the center of the Black Cross, about a half mile north of downtown Mount Holly. Woodlawn Avenue separates the mill from Dutchman's Creek, which flows into the Catawba River at the east edge of Mount Holly. The National Register boundary follows the right of way adjacent to the edges of the parcel, a residual 3.5 acre tract. 
The property contains three contributing buildings moving north to south, a cotton warehouse, a transformer house, and the factory. The small parcel on the west side of the mill formerly contained an electric substation. The east side of the mill is the main facade. Between the 19th and mid 20th centuries, the late 19th and mid 20th centuries, the textile industry thrived in Mount Holly and throughout Gaston County. And by 1930, the town boasted 10 mills. Beginning in the late 19th century, Mount Holly businessman and textile industrialist Charles E. Hutchinson invested in textile mills around the growing town and eventually owned six of them. In 1905, he hired noted mill designer and engineer Stuart W. Kramer to draw up plans for Woodlawn Mill, an electricity powered textile manufacturing plant and 25 houses for mill employees. Due to extensive alterations, the adjacent mill village, including the single house just south of the mill, was not considered for inclusion in this nomination. In 1907, the mill and transformer house were completed. Woodlawn Manufacturing Company made coarse cotton yarn and later combed yarns. In 1920, Woodlawn merged with Hutchison's American Yarn and Processing Company, and in 1952, a merger with the Eford Manufacturing Company of Albemarle resulted in the creation of American and Eford Inc., which operated 18 plants in the United States and internationally. In this composite floor plan, turned clockwise 90 degrees, you can see the original mill distinguished by the classically detailed crenellated tower, which is a rare survivor. Small additions circled in blue were made on the main east facade in 1937 and on the west side in 1963. Construction of significant additions to the south end of the mill began in 1937 with the warping and winding room, which entailed removal of the mill's original south end wall. This was followed in 1941 by the twisting room angled to the southwest, and that's shown at the upper left. Offices on the east side in 1953, which is shown on the lower right, and the packing and shipping room at the far south end in 1963, and that is shown at the far left. Significant additions to the north end of the mill comprise the room built in 1944 and enlarged in 1965 for the processing of cotton waste and the cotton waste machinery room added in 1970. The machinery room originally consisted of two units and a circa 2020 and in circa 2020, a north unit, a maintenance shop uh, was demolished after the roof failed. The roof of the remaining south unit is quite deteriorated, but does not appear to be to the point that this unit cannot be restored or rehabilitated. Due to the topography, the west side of the mill is very difficult to photograph, but here are a couple of views. The interiors are what you would expect. At the upper left, a view of the original mill's heavy timber-framed interior, where most of the octagonal wood posts supporting the chamfered roof beams were replaced by steel columns in the early 1960s. An interior view of the 1937 warping and winding room addition at the south end of the mill is in the middle and a view of the 1944 cotton waste room addition with steel roof beams on the north end is to the right. The other two resources are the 1907 transformer house and the 1950 frame cotton warehouse, which is connected to the rest of the facility by a concrete loading platform. A second warehouse stood on the south side of the poured concrete firewall that separated the two buildings, but was demolished around 2020 due to deterioration from water infiltration. In 1959, American and Eford sold the Woodlawn plant to Kimberly Yarn Mills, which was subsequently acquired by Fieldcrest Mills in 1963. The name of the mill was changed to Mount Holly Spinning, and under Fieldcrest ownership, the company modernized the mill, replacing wood posts with steel, installing a new air conditioning system, and bricking in the windows. The mill's chronology, starting as a fairly small, independently owned business that eventually was consumed by a large corporate entity through consolidation, is typical of the textile industry. 
Woodlawn continued to manufacture textiles until 2002, when Kimberly Yarn Mills shut it down amid the widespread closing of cotton mills throughout the region. The building is now vacant after a period of general warehouse use. In 2014, Preservation North Carolina secured an option to purchase the mill and sold the property to the current owner, Lehigh Holdings LLC, in 2016 with protective preservation covenants for future redevelopment and reuse of the mill. Woodlawn Mill retains a good degree of integrity as a fully realized example of a 20th century cotton mill in the prominent textile producing region of Gaston County. Although enlarged, the original mill retains significant elements of its design, including the crenellated tower, heavy timber roof construction, and rhythmic pattern of segmental arch window openings, most of which are now bricked in but clearly defined. Later changes and additions represent the development of textile production through the mid 20th century with the introduction of improved fire suppression and sprinkler systems, air conditioning, interior lighting, and the use of fireproof concrete and steel, as well as a need for greater warehouse space and occurred within the period of significance. Deterioration due to water penetration and deferred maintenance remains confined to discrete areas, mostly within the latter additions, and does not com compromise the overall integrity of the mill building. Today, Woodlawn Mill is one of only two Mount Holly mills to remain substantially intact, retaining key historical elements of design and construction to represent the importance of the textile industry to the local economy during the early to mid 20th century and thus meets criterion A in the area of industry. Uh, the other remaining mill is the Mount Holly Cotton Mill, which was listed in the National Register in 1996. As a fairly intact representative of standard mill construction as it changed during the period, including the rare surviving tower of the original 1907 mill, it also meets criterion C in the area of architecture. The period of significance is 1907 to 1972. I will hold this uh, staff recommendation is that you are follow, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Jeff, you want to do yours and then we'll wait on the Western region. Do we need to vote? Yes, you have to leave. Enjoy walking the halls. It's lonely yeah. out there. You see how long this can be here. Yeah. I had to do it a couple of times. <laughs> Okay, so before I get started, I just wanted to announce that all the nominations that we presented to you all in, at our June meeting, including the BK Miller House uh, and the Waldensian Swiss Embroidery Company in the West, the Cone Gray House, the Wimple Shelton House, the Neville House, and the Uzzle Best Farm in the Piedmont Central Region, and the Holtz Chapel School and the Franks House in the Eastern Territory were all listed in the National Register. Okay. So um, this is actually, like Beth said, this is the work of Hannah Beckman Black, but baby Beckman Black interrupted the presentation. So uh, this is Hannah's work, but I'm happy to present to you the Walton Street Park and Pool, located in Asheville in Buncombe County. The Walton Street Park and Pool is at the southern end of the historically Black Southside neighborhood, historically referred to as East Riverside. The property is being nominated for its local significance under Criterion A in the areas of Black ethnic heritage, entertainment, recreation, and social history. The nomination details the efforts and struggles of Asheville's Black community during the Jim Crow era to secure acceptable land, funding, and support from the city to establish a municipal park with adequate amenities while white citizens were provided with well-funded municipal parks and pools, such as Malvern Hill, to the West and Recreation Park in the east part of town. The period of significance spans from 1939, the year the park was established, to 1973, 50 years ago, as the park remains in use today and there is no other logical end to the period of significance. So this is a Sanborn map from 1956. You can see the light blue shading that shows the pool to the left and it's in the slower corner here and then the bathhouse is in the darker blue. 
Uh, Walton Street Park, originally named Riverview Park, was established in 1939 by the city of Asheville with WPA funds as the city's sole municipal park for the black population. Before the park opened, outdoor recreational facilities for black residents were limited to small neighborhood playgrounds on school grounds. The first such pool was the Mountain Street Pool constructed in 1916 in the East End neighborhood. It operated until at least 1935, but Sanborn maps indicate it was gone by 1950. Walton Street Park was originally built with a wading pool, tennis and horseshoe courts, and a small playground, but none of these facilities remain extant today. In 1947-48, the city added a poured concrete pool and a concrete block bathhouse to the park. The pool became the second and longest standing municipal pool established for black residents of Asheville. A softball diamond was added to the street park in the 1950s and an asphalt basketball court in the 1960s. The segregated park became a cherished public meeting space and a recreational hub for the black community. Such as the topo map. Although amenities have come and gone through the years, some as recently as the summer of 2023, the park's 4.37 acre lot has remained unchanged since its establishment. The nomination uh, includes three contributing resources, the park as an overall site, the swimming pool and the bathhouse, and three non-contributing resources, a circa 2000 picnic pavilion, which you can see up here, a recent, recently configured basketball court right here, and a multi-use recreational field, which was installed in the summer of 2023. So although the aerial footage does not show the current amenities, uh, this is the latest uh, aerial photography that's at our availability. But we do have some photos to show uh, a walking trail. We're now gonna take a quick spin around the park and look at each individual resource. This is the swimming pool, although not in use, retains good integrity. The bathhouse the retains good in exterior integrity. And on the inside, this is another elevation. That shed roof addition we think is a pump house. Uh, but this is the interior, of course. It has a small, let's see, uh, remodeled sometime after 1985. The interior was upgraded with uh, concrete block walls covered with ceramic tile for privacy, as well as a drop ceiling. Even with these interior changes, it retains adequate integrity to convey its significance. <clears throat> this is the newly reconfigured and resurfaced basketball court shown in the foreground of the photograph. Obviously the hoops aren't up yet and backwards. And so the softball diamond was converted into this uh, multi-use recreational field, which features a walking trail. And just again, that's, it still has a multi-purpose uh, multi recreational field, uh, but these, this is not contributing due to its age. This is a close-up of the picnic shelter adjacent and the adjacent playground. Uh, they're not contributing due to their age. And this is just entrance to the pool. The nominated boundary includes the full extent of the 4.37 acre lot containing the pool, bathhouse, and recreational areas. Uh, let's see, the Walton Street Park and Pool are among the few landmarks of Black Asheville that remain standing today. The neighborhood around it changed radically during the urban renewal movement of the 1960s and 70s, yet the park remained relatively unaltered. The park's layers of significance as an African-American heritage, recreational, and social history site are intertwined and interdependent. As the sole public park serving Asheville's Black population, the park and pool remain without comparison today. Look at that. I think that... I think that's the end. <laughs> um, we received comments from Asheville and Buncombe County Historic Resources Commission, uh, and they believe the nomination meets the criteria for listing. Uh, we also consulted with the staff in the Office of State Archaeology, and due to um, significant ground disturbing activity, they do not believe that the site has ar architectural archaeological potential. So any questions? Comments? I do, uh, one, we, we've looked at this 
previously, correct? And their issue then was the property boundary extended onto a, and, and that landowner objected? It correct? was it was going to be presented and we had an objection from a private property owner. And because there were two owners, one of which was public and one of which was private, the only thing, our only option would have been to send it on to the keeper for a determination of eligibility. But then uh, the work, the city kind of had put on a fast track. And so the work happened to the physical site quicker than anticipated. Um, so the boundary now does not no longer includes that part of that baseball diamond since it's been disturbed. Hmm. Meaning, meaning it's, it's, it only has one, one owner. Correct. Yeah, there's only one owner in that city. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any comments? Are y'all ready to vote? Do we, oh, we need to get point of order? Do we vote on this one first? We should do maybe this one first. I'm sorry. Um, we should probably first because well, we're we keep out and then she needs to come back in to do the other thing. Okay. All right. That, very good thing you got, Joss. Well, it was like a bad thing here. All in favor of this nomination, say aye. 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 Opposed? Let's have it. Okay. So I'm used to these, us uh, going with staff break recommendation that uh, I think is the last thing to not ask if there were any nays on it. <laughs> All right, the Woodland Mill in Mount Hollis. Can I ask Hollis a question Bay. about that? What? The boundaries for that, is that now an option to use street right away paving versus property lines? This for one? the park and pool or for the mill? For Woodlawn. The boundaries don't follow the property lines are out in the edges of the paving versus street right away. I don't know, Beth, can you speak to that? It's really up to the repair and, and the sponsor where you want to put the boundary or where it makes no sense based on the history of the resource. That's so it sometimes it sometimes people put it out no the further. edge of the pavement. Sometimes it follows. Well, that's on the open park service directly. They said you gotta stay at the property lines. You're not gonna go beyond you're gonna include all or nothing on the property. So that's why it's one of now an option to yeah. Beyond. Yeah, you can go beyond. And you can go, like, you can follow a tree line. You don't have to follow the property. Okay. Right. I thought they told us in the NHL. They wanted it on the property line. They want to cut through the middle of the property. Yeah. <laughs> part of the NR is not picking on that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the boundaries themselves can be, like Sarah said, they can be natural features as long as it reflects the historic use of the property. So, um, I think that's what you have to consider for the mill. But and that mill sits right up. Yeah, it's like it sits right up at the street. So the map those the boundaries go in and out of the property lines. That's why I was kind of curious why that was different, right? Now. It's an interesting question though with the right of way, because the municipality carried the day or do something that was so inappropriate that it was kind of you know, seems low likely than that. Well, you just repay the street and all of a sudden it's moved through. Are y'all ready to vote on the Woodland Mills property? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. I'm sorry, who moved to break that? What? I'm sorry. Who made the motion? Yeah, we did not. We did not. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. Okay. The record is a long morning. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Valerie made the motion a second. A second. You gave a second. Okay. All right. We're going to the central and southeastern region. And let, let's break this up. Let's do the first two. And then we'll go and then we'll have one and then we'll build the others. Okay. You are going to see me more than you want to today. But um, this first nomination in, in the central and southeastern region is for the Winston Lake Golf Course. Um, see here, it's located in Winston Salem in Forsyth County. There it is to the big red star. It's kind of a general location within the county. So it's in the northeast part of Winston-Salem. And again, just some more locational mapping, the green shaded area within that oval. 
is the course. Okay, located in Northeast Winston-Salem, the municipally owned Winston Lake Golf Course dates to 1956 with a 1964 expansion. The course is a component of Winston Lake Park, which was developed during the 1950s, adjacent to an early 20th century municipal reservoir. Winston Lake Park is about two miles northeast of Winston-Salem Central Business District between New Walker Town Road, US 11, 311, on the left, that blue, that blue arrow on the left, uh, to the west and Old Greensboro Road slash Reedsville Road, US 158 to the east, which kind of snakes around there. So there's an aerial view, view that shows the entirety of the 18-hole course as it is today. Uh, these are just six shots that the preparer uh, took of the various holes. Uh, so starting in the at the six o'clock six o'clock position and moving clockwise, uh, the number of this photo here shows uh, it's looking south on hole number one towards the clubhouse. Number two in the lower left, looking south on hole three. In the upper left is number, uh, picnic shelter with the, with the driving range. You can kind of see the shelter. This mouth is stubborn. All right, there. The next photo here in the upper right is uh, looking south on hole 13. And we even caught an action shot there. <laughs> and then finally, in the bottom right is uh, looking north on hole 12. The course is characterized by hilly terrain, narrow fairways flanked by wooded areas, <laughs> steep cart paths and hazards, including creeks at the base of ravines. Maintenance examples include work on the practice on the putting green, <clears throat> irrigation system and tee boxes, uh, as well as cart path resurfacing. Uh, on, co on course comfort station construction, as well as bridge refurbishment, has been sensitively undertaken. These modifications, along with tree removal and pruning to maintain sight lines, are typical elements of golf course renovation that improve quality of play without altering course character. This is the north half of the site plan, although it does cut off some of the upper holes here. But there's your comfort station, some of the bridges along the pathway. And here's the southern half, more modern construction here. These are ancillary structures. It's a clubhouse, pic a picnic shelter. I think they're ubiquitous. Um, And then the remaining slides are pretty much close-ups of these, some of these ancillary structures. So the chemical storage building, which the white arrow is pointing to it in the site plan and the black arrow is pointing from the margin onto the site plan. In the lower left is the E. Jerry Jones Clubhouse from 2001, which replaced a 1968 clubhouse building that despite being enlarged in the 1980s, no longer met administrative and guest needs. So there's a maintenance building. Um, this structure in the upper right corner is it's really interesting. They're just, they're basically headstones that were found uh, during the construction of the course. Um, and I don't know whether the nomination does not go into whether human remains were found, but um, rather than leaving them flat on the course, they kind of created this memorial put it inside of a, you know, secured gate. Finally, again, the comfort station. It's a fancy way of saying a restroom. So despite building construction, ongoing maintenance, again, and, and repairs as needed, Winston Lake Golf Course retains integrity of location, setting, feeling, and association as it remains at its original site within Winston Lake Park and continues to serve as a recreational venue. The 18 hole course also possesses integrity of design, materials and workmanship due to substantial retention of the 1956 and 1964 hole configurations.
This is the boundary proposed. Uh, the National Register boundary encompasses an approximately 221 acre portion of the park north of Winston Park Drive that contains the 18 hole golf course constructed in two phases, again in 1956 and 1964. The surrounding wooded buffer areas buffer neighboring mid to late 20th century residential subdivisions, including Fairway Park Estates, platted in 1955 northwest of the course. The Winston Lake Golf Course at Winston Lake Park is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places at the local level of significance under Criterion A due to its significance in the areas of Black ethnic heritage and entertainment and recreation. The facility has played an important role in the recreational, social, and political life of the city's African-American population from its 1956 opening until the present day. Built during an era of de facto racial segregation, Winston Lake Park manifested the city's initiative to equalize rather than integrate its black and white recreational venues. Before 1956, African-American golfing in Forsyth County was limited to private country clubs, including Forsyth and Old Town and the city-owned Reynolds Park Golf Course, where black caddies were permitted to play only when courses were officially shut down on Mondays or otherwise not in use. In response to a request from African-American community leaders, the Reynolds Park Commission permitted black golfers to use the course, but no other facilities on Mondays and Fridays from late November 1953 until Winston Lake Golf Course opened three years later. Some aficionados of the sport traveled to Noco Park in Greensboro, the first, first municipal course in North Carolina established for our African-American golfers during its operation from 1950 until December 1955. The creation and expansion of Winston-Salem's first golf course to which black players enjoyed unrestricted admittance was thus a significant achievement for local residents and organizations, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People that demanded desegregation of municipal departments, programs, and venues, including hospitals, schools, libraries, recreational facilities, as well as privately owned concerns such as stores, restaurants, and hotels and motels. The Winston Lake Golfers Association, formed in May of 1960, successfully challenged exclusionary practices and inequitable conditions at Forsyth County golf courses and compelled completion of Winston Lake's back nine holes in 1964. The course has always been an important recreational and social venue utilized by a diverse array of community members. A popular destination for local and regional African-American golfers, Winston Lake has hosted myriad professional, amateur, and intercollegiate tournament tournaments. Tournament tournaments. <laughs> um, numerous Black players pursuing professional golfing careers have improved skills and gained management experience at Winston Lake. Interracial relationships strengthened through, through golfing stimulated civic and fraternal organization establishment and execution of community initiatives. Youth clinics and frater fraternal organizations, establishment and execution, sorry, I'm repeating myself. Um, youth clinics and programs developed leadership and teamwork skills and fostered personal growth, thus empowering young people to pursue higher education and realize community uplift. Uh, the period of significance be begins with the 1956 completion of the first nine holes and ends in 1973 as golf as course operation during the past 50 years is not exceptionally significant. Uh, we received comments from both uh, the Winston-Salem Mayor's Office and the Forsyth County Human um, Historic Resources Commission in support of the nomination. Uh, we uh, also consulted with the Office of State Archaeology and they did not believe that the site uh, possessed archeological potential. So that is all for this one, I believe. Comments? Questions? One, one question. Didn't we also see this one in a previous meeting? Felt like this seemed familiar to me. Am I the only one? Study list. Study list. That's why. That's why it rings a bell. Okay. Yeah, archaeology didn't have any comment, didn't think they would. I was a little surprised that they didn't comment on the potential for mm -hmm. the bee and mark folks there because of the headstones. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't affect the you know the 
solid to build bridges. Yeah, it's just it's just one other area of significance that you know could be added if uh of course you know that just the consideration for any improvements or yeah. Things. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion to accept these two nominations? We haven't gotten to. Oh, stop. I haven't done Mignola yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> My mind is slipping today. <laughs> it's catching Miss Snowden. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I brought it to the, to the party. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is another one of Claudia's uh, nominations that she reviewed, but she's unable to be here today. So I'm presenting the presentation for the Mineola Manufacturing Company Mill in Gibsonville in Gil Guilford County. The Mineola Manufacturing Company Mill is located in the heart of Gibsonville, just inside Guilford County. On the left, you see Gibsonville between Greensboro and Burlington, and on the USGS quad map to the right, the red star marks the mill. This map also shows the Guilford Alamance County line running through the middle of, of Gibsonville. Due to the mill's location, practically on the county line, the historical context for this nomination addresses the development of the textile industry in both counties. The mill is located just across the railroad from the town's central business district, a location that symbolizes the mill's historic importance as the town's primary economic engine throughout most of the 20th century. The National Registry National Register boundary follows the right of way to encompass the entire block occupied by the mill. An associated mill village was built adjacent to the mill and extends farther southwest. The portion of the village next to the mill, the green space, was dismantled in the early 1950s and the rest of the village has lost most of its historic integrity. So I think this is quite an understatement. This is a complicated property uh, <laughs> consisting of uh, 22 counted resources of which all but five contribute to its historic significance. The largest primary resource faces Railroad Avenue and that frontage is considered the mill's main facade the earliest buildings are at the southeast end of the block, circled in green. And the most recent properties, all non-contributing due to age, are concentrated at the northwest end, circled and outlined in red. The 1975 to 1977 cloth room slash slasher beaming room slash tie-in room, marked with an S over up in the left here, the 1979 Weave Room, which is the T, and the circa 1976 Electrical Building, here's U. The Refrigerator Room and Cooling Tower, uh, indicated by the V, built in 1980, and one of the three well houses marked with a P on the map down here in the lower right. Built circa 1980, one resource, the cloth storage warehouse, circled in blue. Okay. And shown here was listed in the, in the register in 2018. The original 1937 construction is to the right, and the two additions built in 1935 and 53 are to the left. The North Carolina Railroad Company completed tracks through what became the center of Gibsonville in 1855. Businesses grew up slowly around the station in the 1850s and 1860s to provide goods and services to local farmers and miners. There were numerous gold and copper mines in Guilford County, and the town was incorporated in 1871 as Gibsonville, named for local farmer Joseph Gibson, who had provided grading services for the railroad. While the railroad was the reason for the town's existence, the Mineola Cotton Manufacturing Company was responsible for its growth. And from its establishment, the mill both dominated the local economy and held a prominent physical position within the community. In 1886, Barry and Joseph Davidson established Gibsonville's first mill when they constructed a brick building adjacent, immediately adjacent to the railroad and depot. In 1889, after they and, and two other partners incorporated the Mineola Manufacturing Company for the, quote, manufacture of cotton into threads, cloths, and fabrics, and general merchandise, end quote, 
they enlarged the original building. And it is this, it, and it is this addition identified as mill number one or A in red that now stands as the oldest extant building in the complex. Originally, it was about 25 bays long, and today, two-thirds of it remains, the other third at the east end having been demolished in 1976. Okay, so as these photos show, the mill is in the early stages of rehabilitation. The photo at upper left shows mill number one in 2021. All the older mill buildings facing Railroad Avenue were brick veneered and otherwise altered in the 1970s, to present a uniform facade as new windowless additions were built at the northwest end of the complex. Earlier this year, the current owners removed most of the veneer, leaving some of it and the later windows in place as shown at upper right. So you can kind of, the picture's not great, but you can kind of make out the original brick, which is more brownish in color than the reddish uh, veneer. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so then the, and an antique small at lower right is occupies part of the building. At lower left is a view of part of the south side of the building, which only had its windows bricked in as the mill was modernized. In 1892, 1892 brothers Moses and Caesar Cohn purchased stock in the Mineola Manufacturing Company, and by 1893, owned a controlling interest in the firm. By 1900, the Mineola Manufacturing Company was operating as a weaving subsidiary of the Cone Export and Commission Company. The Cone brothers were instrumental in establishing numerous mills and purchasing others and would build a textiles empire focused on Guilford County. The Mineola Manufacturing Company held a relatively minor place in the Cone family's textile enterprise, but it was the center of Gibsonville's industry and therefore benefited the town. In 1893, Mineola Mill more than doubled in size with construction of Mill Number 2, shown here, to accommodate a larger weaving department and a new finishing room and spinning mill. As these photos show, 2021 at upper left and recent at lower right, most of the brick veneer has been removed here as well. So you can kind of see the old signage there the original fenestration. Other resources built in 1903 or shortly thereafter were the engine room, boiler house, and the railroad siding and trestle, both at lower left, and the picker house to the right. Circular reservoir, lower middle image, lower middle image, and a pump house circled in red. By 1910, the cloth storage warehouse that is already listed in the National Register, as well as the smokestack shown in the previous slide, the dye house at lower left, and the first units of the raw cotton warehouse in the lower right had been added. By 1915, Gibsonville had two additional textile mills, the Jim Cotton Mill and Gibsonville Hosiery Mill, but Mineola remained the largest and, and besides being the major employer, benefited the town by establishing fire protection, water supply systems, and other services. It wasn't until 1923 that the town established its own fire department using the water system put in place by the Mineola Mill. Halfway there. The Mineola plant was enlarged significantly in 1925 with the construction of mill number three. Unlike the slow burn timber frame constructions of mill one and two, mill number three was constructed of reinforced concrete with concrete floors, walls, and roof. Note the four monitors in this upper left here. Now boarded over, the large ductwork for a ventilation system was added in the 1950s. Mill number three extended to the, to the vertical red line Here, as you can uh, da -da, as you can see in the image at top left, this mill was also brick veneered, and when the nineteen seven when the late nineteen seventies veneer was removed earlier this year, 
everyone was, was everyone was surprised to find that the building had previously been veneered. The preparer of the nomination figured out that the first veneer was applied in 1953 when the two-story infill between mills number two and three was constructed, the circled area and the lower image. Removal of the later veneer did reveal the original concrete base of the walls. Gibsonville weathered the Great Depression, although one of its three mills, the Jim Cotton Mill, closed. The period from 1941 to 1951 showed tremendous growth for the textile industry in general and the cone-operated mills in particular. Through the 1940s, Mineola Manufacturing Company remained the city's largest employer with 750 workers in 1949. Numerous improvements in the 1950s included the infill between mills number two and mill three, as well as expansion of warehouses, dye waste disposal facilities, and a wander room. Installation of air conditioning and the associated bricking in of the windows began and was completed in the 1960s. As production shifted to denim and flannels and then to sateens and poplins in the 1950s and in the 1960s, to cotton twills, sateens, corduroys, and herringbones, new, more efficient machinery was installed that led to both increased production and reductions in the workforce. Nevertheless, the plant remained the largest of Gibsonville's industries and continued to employ the most workers. In the 1970s, a sharp increase in textile imports led cone officials to embark on yet another modernization program to remain competitive. At the Mineola Mill, two large additions were constructed, a cloth room by 1977, marked by an S in the slide, and the weave room at the northwest end of the complex in 1979, indicated by a T. So they're both on the, on the left side of that black polygon. As noted earlier, a few other small resources also were added by 1980, circled in red. The T-shaped cloth room is at upper left and below is a view from Railroad Avenue of the weave room. Citing competition from imported fabric, unfavorable business conditions, and the need to consolidate its operations, in October 1988, Cone Mills Corporation announced the closing of the Mineola plant by the end of that year. In 1990, a group of investors purchased the property for operation as Lindley Industrial Park. Since then, Lindley Laboratories, Inc., which produces chemicals for textile companies, have operated in, has operated in part of the space and its leased portions of the remaining buildings to several small businesses, although much of the plant remains vacant. Can't say that. So finally, the Mineola Manufacturing Company Mill is locally significant under National Register Criterion A for industry as the largest of three textile mills in, in Gibsonville and the town's largest employer for much of the 20th century. The period of significance is 1889 to 1973. Uh, HPO staff consulted with staff in the OSA and they do believe that the site has archeological potential. And that is all for that. I'll repeat myself. Would you like any comments on either one of these properties? Are you ready to make a decision? I have a I'd move to approve the Winston Lake Golf Course and Mineola Manufacturing Company nominations. Second. Second those. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Second. Aye. 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 Jeff, your next one. Yes, ma'am. I have a point of order question. I mean, I didn't have any role in this. Um, nomination, but I work for UNC Chapel. Is that conditioned to refuse myself or am I fine to stick on? I would assume I will turn this out. Do you want to turn on Lisa? Yeah. I mean, maybe better to say than sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Gonna soundproof booth. <laughs> okay. Um, 
The title of this building is a mouthful. Um, this presentation is for the Navy Reserve Officers Training Corps Naval Armory that I will here and after refer to as the Armory. Uh, the Armory is located in Chapel Hill, which is in southeastern Orange County, near the Orange Durham County line. Uh, the red star shows an aerial view of the Armory's location in the densely populated town of Chapel Hill, surrounded by National Register listed Chapel Hill and West Chapel Hill Historic Districts, as well as several National Historic Landmarks, and the University of North Carolina's North Campus. The Armory is located on UNC's South Campus. A closer aerial view of the 0.25 acre property that houses the Armory and two ancillary structure objects. Uh, one of those is a non-contributing flagpole. Ta-da! <laughs> and an anti-aircraft 105 millimeter howitzer gun. Ta-da! Which is contributing. Um, the this is the facade, well, Pardon me. This is the facade of the armory. Opened in 1943, Durham-based architect Archie Royal Davis designed the southwest facing building in the Colonial Revival architectural style. That's Mr. Davis there, along with his wife, Frances, in the upper left. Uh, the Colonial Revival architectural style is widely seen across the UNC campus. Archie Davis was a North Carolina native, born in 1907, passed in 1980. He was a prolific architect with over 500 commissions throughout his career, which spanned from 1926 to 1980, working most often in the Georgian Revival, Colonial Revival, and modernist architectural styles. His other, other notable designs include the Morehead Planetarium, the Durham County Courthouse, the Carolina Inn, and the really interesting two roundhouses on South Duke Street in Durham. Okay. He designed churches, houses, I mean, all manner of buildings. Uh, these are just some other views of the building. This is the portico on the facade on the left, the southwest elevation in the right. That's the rear elevation on the left and the north elevation on the, on the right. And these are just two interior images. A drill deck, uh, I thought it was a teaching room, but maybe that's you know military specific. And this is a typical corridor shot on the right. These are some of the historic images found in the special collections at UNC. They weren't identified. Obviously, that's the building in the middle, but uh, you know, groups of officers, maybe uh, obviously nurses. The proposed National Register boundary follows the boundaries historically associated with the armory and its use during the proposed period of significance. Given that the resource is part of a singular parcel that comprises the UNC Chapel Hill campus, conventional par parcel lines are not present. Recommended individually eligible for the National Register at the local level of significance under criterion A in the areas of education and the military significance. The United States Navy sponsored the building's construction as part of the war effort and used the building as a training facility or or two. Uh, effort. I should qualify that. Used as a training facility for future military officers, the Armory embodies the broad pattern of defense built up in North Carolina during World War, II, World War II, as well as the changing patterns of higher education during this period. The building's exterior remains unaltered since its original construction. And although the interior has been subject to changes in order to maintain adequate mechanical systems, infrastructure, Adequate integrity is, main, is retained to convey its historic associations. The proposed period of significance is 1943. It's opening to 1970, which corresponds 
um, to a lot of anti-war protests, um, one of which uh, was in, uh, that happened on Chapel Hill's campus, which was inspired by the Kent State Massacre. Um, demonstrations led by students against U.S. involvement in Cambodia on May 5th, 1970, 2,000 students marched from Polk Place in a loop that brought them past the armory building. Once there, protesters rushed the flagpole, lowering it to half staff for those st students killed at Kent State University just a day earlier. Uh, our office received letters of support from the Chapel Hill Human, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna call it Human Resources, Historic um, Resources Commission, as well as the mayor of Chapel Hill. Uh, we also received a letter from the University of North Carolina uh, requesting that the nomination be denied or at least postponed until the February meeting. Now, I can read the letter in its entirety if you would like. I'm feeling every one of us sitting here has already read the letter. Okay. So. Unless uh, anybody wants to hear it again. I'm happy to read it. So yes or no? I didn't see anybody say they needed no, this. So okay, yeah. okay. Well, that's all I have for this one. I, the staff recommends? I mean, the nomination supports, you know, it's, it's an eligible resource in the areas of significance. Yes. Well, as a um, graduate of Chapel Hill, I was actually at that protest. Uh, oh wow! Yeah. I didn't. I didn't jump the flagpole. <laughs> um, it, that's personal. Uh, it, it was, by the way, it was referred to in those days as the ROTC uh, building, mm -hmm. and um, it, it was a huge contingent, even in my day, of naval ROTC students at Chapel Hill. Ironically, just within the last month, I'm reading John Meacham's uh, biography of George H. W. Bush. He remember he was shot down in the Pacific. He began his naval career in Chapel Hill at the ROTC. I understand. And that uh, Barbara Bush, his wife, uh, write they write in the book that she had uh, taken a train to Raleigh and they took the bus on fifty four to Chapel Hill and spent a couple of nights in the uh, Carolina Inn, which is across the street. Mm -hmm. So it's got that was George H. W. Bush's first assignment in his military which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly as a, um, you know, personal yeah. you know, to it. I'm not, I don't object to the eligibility part of it, but I'm curious with the objection from the university, what weight, if any, do we need to give that? Well, we have, well, we have, we can approve it, we can disapprove it, or we can do as they ask and postpone it. But if you postpone it, you expect some action. and. Uh, the letter says that they, you know. So a question for staff then, if, if the university owns it, they're the property owner and they object to it. You can so still, you they're can a public still entity it. and it's a public facility. So they can't, they can't, they can't the federal code does not, it's so a private property. What's going to happen between now and February? Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't either. I mean, there. You know, I, I'll I'll just read this passage. It said, "Should the committee should the committee not be inclined to grant the university's request to deny the nomination? We request at a minimum that the committee postpone its review from the meeting scheduled for October twelfth, two thousand twenty-three, until the next meeting, February eighth, two thousand twenty-four, to allow for additional discussion and consideration. The university would welcome the opportunity to submit to submit additional information." and or participate in additional discussions regarding this decision should it be helpful and appreciates the opportunity to provide its perspective on this important issue. Um, the, the ROTC, I think Alumni Association is who sponsored the nomination. I don't think that's something that we can't disclose. So. <laughs> Is the presumption in underlying all of this that the university uh, board is feeling like we're meddling into their long range plans or they want to be the, in control of this? Uh, is that the gist of what the objection is? that or they won't have another use for that area, which is a possibility. Oh, exactly. And uh, because that, 
that's a lot of construction around it, the bulldozing old chemistry buildings and all that stuff. I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, I don't need to share. Uh, there is some political aspect of governance in the at the university level at this point. So it might be a, a dean that we're trying to poke. Into but the uses. I, I personally would like to proceed on with a personal term. I think it's almost outrageous that this wouldn't be considered legitimate. Um, I, I agree. I don't see any value in, in postponing it. I don't, I don't know what, <clears throat> what, what different information we would look at in the future that we don't have now. I also so. agree. And in light of our historical commission wanting to elevate history in North Carolina, um, whether, however you feel about ROTC and the building, it's significant historically too. I mean, just right. that little bit you shared right now is something to be considered. I mean, anecdotal information like that, yeah, it, it just provides a more personal um, I don't know. I guess it makes it more relatable. You know, it's like having, conducting an oral history of a family that's been in a house for generations. Um, but the letter implied the university was not told that this process was going on until the last minute. So I guess my general significance aside, mm -hmm. is there any expectation of a proper way to behave or move ahead with these, i.e., nominating? Properties not owned by the nominating party. No, really, that not. gives me pause. But any, in fact, anybody can propose any property, whether they own it or not. Now, if the person proposes, say, a property that is not that they do not own, and the owner objects, then normally it does not go back. But what makes the difference here is it is part of the UNC system, which is a publicly owned building. And so therefore it does not fall under that category. So. I mean, if, they're, if their intention is more clerical in nature in terms of timing, they would appreciate you know, the consideration of having this internally discussed, whatever, I get that. I just, I'm also worried about the, as they say, poke the bear around yeah. the politics of all this stuff. That, Fortunately, we live with at every level of government now. So it is, it is what it is. So I guess the question back to staff is what potential risk do we have to postpone just as, as a courtesy to the university? So, uh, just to briefly address the notification, um, if they get notifications, they receive notifications just like every um, owner does and said timeline for that in the process. Um, and the um, it's sort of, in this case, it was really kind of up to the sponsor to have conversations with the university ahead of time. Um, in terms of uh, um, a risk, I, I mean, I can't really um, speak to that, you know, like the student said, y'all can approve it, defer it, or not, not approve it. Um, the, the nomination makes the case and staff's opinion for right. the success Absolutely. of the island case. My question, you know, that I think, uh, if I were, if I was in your seat that I would want to think about is, um, what, what is deferment going to result in? Um, mm -hmm. and they, they are not a private owner, so their objection would not stop a nomination. Um, so, you know, and one thing confirming would get you is just some, some goodwill and some, uh, you know, being nice to a, you know, fellow public entity. Um, so that's, that's always nice. Is it going to ultimately change the outcome? Um, no matter what information they bring to y'all, it, it may convince you to not, to not approve it, but, uh, but you got a good strong case to approve it in front of you. Um, right now, so um, I have a point, and this is more practical and on about staff. We, I know there's 
considerable pressure to move these nominations through and to get things done. And I'm not saying we need to be hasty, but I do respect the fact that a lot of thought, a lot of energy and time has already gone in, into it. And the sooner we are able to make decisions, then the next things can come in line. And I just wanted to remind everyone that there is this other pressure just to get, get things done and not always kick things down down the road. And I think it helps relieve some of that um, pressure on the, on the staff. I mean, for me, sometimes it helps to think about things too, even though ridiculously illogical like conclusion, which is if you approve this, what happens if 20 other historic buildings that are clearly historic on campus were nominated that start to have a huge impact on how campuses develop over time? I mean, I would agree that clearly the nomination makes the case, I, but I personally have concerns with the, the process, and I'm not sure what deferring would buy us in terms of time either, but this to me is not something to take lightly. Okay. I have to have a nomination. And as you said, you have three choices. Yay, nay, or postpone it to the next meeting. Do you need a motion first? To, I need a motion. Need a motion. You want to go. I'll, I'll make a motion that we accept the staff's recommendation and approve the nomination. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 All yes. opposed? Nay. Nay. We have two ayes and two nays. Uh, so no, you don't need to vote anyway. Well, I think you need to vote. Okay. Okay. So hold on one second. Okay. Did everybody vote except me? I haven't voted. Okay. And let's do the eyes again. We have three and the nays. Three. Oh. <laughs> <man. laughs> in there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not a politician. But I, I do think that I vote yay. I'm worried about, I, I really, to be honest, I don't think it would hurt to move it forward, you know, to, to hold it for a week, but we'd have to be seeing the exact same thing next week. So it passes. Thank you. Just as a matter of procedure, I mean, the, the nominations, you'll know, will not stop there no. any sort of activity on the university's part. So, um, putting it out there. Thank you. Yeah, if, if, if I may say so, if there does appear to be stronger reasons, and this is creating more angst than we right. need to have come at us. We ought to at least have some way of hearing the knives. Yes. What's going on? Why the objection beyond just the letter? Since we won't have a public it. hearing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think certainly some of their points. Those two public hearings. So, what's the other recommend it? No. So here it's filled. All right. Shall we come back to you? Can we bring back Mary Beth? Mary Beth. Here she's coming. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Mary Beth's coming back. Yeah. I think that's All right. Um, good to see everyone. Good morning. I guess you're still morning. Um, my first presentation for National Register today is the Wood Rains Cotton Gym located in Princeton. And I want to say that um, this was initially started the review for Hannah, with Hannah Blackman, Beckman Black, and um, we kind of, kind of tag team, and I, I helped fit it out with the um, preparer. The town of Princeton is located on the eastern edge of Johnston County, and the cotton gin is north of the railroad tracks within the small three-block business district facing southwest at 206 West Railroad Avenue. The Wood Rains Cotton Gin was built in 1917. The rectangular side gable gin building is constructed of load-bearing brick with a single truss roof. Ginning is the essential link from field to farm, 
between cotton production and cotton textile manufacturing. In 1921, when the county ranked second in cotton production in North Carolina, there were about 20 cotton gins. During the 1982 Johnston County Compre Comprehensive Countywide Survey, five cotton gins were recorded, and since the update in 2005, only two were thought to have only two are, are thought to have survived. Um, the cotton gin operated from its construction in 1917 to 1946 as the wood cotton gin, then to 1960 as the rains cotton gin until cotton production plummeted in North Carolina due to the introduction of synthetic fabric. The Wood Rains Cotton Gin retains a high degree of all seven aspects of integrity on the exterior and interior. A few exterior features have been altered in over a century of use. The main block is completely intact. Almost all original window shutters are still in place and all doors are original. The ruinous rear L and loading dock shown shows the most wear and tear. The interior retains its division into a large one-story space and two-story loft, which we'll see in other interior photos. The building sits approximately 20 feet north of West Railroad Avenue on an approximately one, one half acre parcel. It is the same parcel purchased by Wood Grocery Company in 1916 and acquired in 1946 by M.B. Rains and now owned by the Thiel C. Rains Revocable Trust. The boundary includes three resources, the main contributing cotton gin building. In the rear of the property, there's one non-contributing site, a concrete foundation of ruinous small outbuildings, and one contributing structure, a concrete block ramp. These are two front oblique views, um, and now we're gonna tour the building around clockwise. Coming around the west side to the northwest corner, you can see the non-contributing ruins of a former outbuilding in the bottom two photographs. To the rear and east side, note the concrete block ramp and a wagon passage on the end of the building, which is a signature element of a cotton gin building. Some details of the exterior include sliding door to the wagon passage, front elevation, and the loading crane on the west end loading dock. The current floor plan includes interior and exterior features, minus the ramp, which is just off the page on the top right. Here's an interior view looking towards a concrete platform at the west end. A signature ensemble of early gen machinery is in the loft area. All ginning equipment in the one story space was removed when the building was converted into grain storage in the mid 20th century. Another interior view highlights the full height two story loft space as well as the gen stand seen here on the right. The 1946 deed transferring the gen building to MB Rains mentions the gen machinery in place and is likely the same machinery there today. The tall wooden gen stand has a wire hopper with remnants of pulley system, a large exhaust pipe exiting through the roof and wood boxes and hopper chutes underneath the platform. A second tall hopper of north of the gen is likely of the same period. So in summary, the Wood Rains Cotton Gin meets National Register eligibility for its local significance under criterion A in the area of industry. Its period of significance corresponds to the functioning years as a cotton gin from 1917 through 1960. The cotton gin now over a century old tells the story of Johnston County's role as one of the top producers of cotton in North Carolina during the first half of the 20th century. And that's all I have for that. Any questions? That's a question. I was really compelled by this nomination, especially the argument about the rarity of the building type. Okay. Yes. Um, but I have heard staff occasionally say, I think it might have been you, Beth, say rarity does not equal significance. Right. That alone is not enough. And so yes. I was curious to hear you guys parse 
how how you weigh rarity mm -hmm. in the case of something like this beyond because you know the cotton industry is significant in our yes case. it is significant and the ginning process itself is really significant when you look at the difference between agriculture and manufacturing um, the processing facility is is really key um, so the fact that it is one of the few left especially in Moore County um, I'm sorry um, um, what county is this? Johnson <laughs> County. <laughs> um, not one of my normal counties I, I look at. Um, is, is in fact significant, but it's not like the last, um, but it's one of the few remaining. And it's, um, I don't believe we have many listed either, which was something of concern and why this was first started by the preparer and why she was very interested in it. Um, does anyone else on staff have a rarity? I was going to say that the rarity issue is more to do with, say there was only ever one cotton gin historically in this county. And then in that case, rarity would not necessarily equal significance because you'd be saying to yourself, well, was cotton really that important to this county if there was only ever this one gin? But when you have a rare survivor of something where there used to be made, and now there's only a handful that, that still retain integrity, then you can use rarity as, as more of a, an argument for why something should be listed because it used to be everywhere and now there's only a few places where we see it. That is really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Beth. That was very eloquent. <laughs> Pull up my second presentation now. Again, not technically my presentation. Claudia Brown was very busy and um, she has reviewed this nomination as well as um, created the PowerPoint. Um, so we're gonna move into the West Southern Pines School located at 1250 West New York Avenue in Southern Pines. <clears throat> West Southern Pines School is located in, now we have more County. <laughs> <laughs> in the area of Southern Pines, Northwest of US-1, known as West Southern Pines, an independently incorporated black municipality from 1923 through 1931. In the map on the upper left, um, the West Southern Pines neighborhood is circled in, um, not red, it's just circled. The area across US-1 is where Southern Pines historic district and a number of other, another, other of individually resources already listed in the National Register. Um, the map at the lower right shows the campus on a 9.44 acre tract occupying half of the block fronting um, South Carlisle Street. So here's an aerial view with the National Register boundary marked with that um, solid black line. Development of the property began with construction of this building containing three classrooms, offices, an auditorium, science laboratory, and library funded, funded by local African-American residents, white citizens, the Rosenwald Fund, and the State Library Fund, which contributed the lion's share of $34,500. This was the second West Southern Pine School. The first one stood a few blocks away, and like this one is no longer standing. Um, let's see, the 1925 school, which you saw on the other slide, um, was located on the east corner of campus, now occupied parking lots. Eleven primary buildings span the campus, all contributing except for two due to age. Although stylistically, you will see one is similar to the buildings that are at least 50 years old. Six classroom buildings and the cafeteria are located on the west side of the service road that bisects the campus. Um, I don't know if the mouse will show, but it's right along in here. And um, let's see. And the gymnasium, auditorium, administration building, and library, and classroom buildings are on the east of the service road. Concrete walks and flat roof breezeways connect buildings. There are also three small storage sheds and two small playgrounds, all non contributing due to their fairly recent age. 
The nine buildings erected on the West Southern Pines School campus from 1951 through 1966 manifest the Southern Pines Board of Education's efforts to equalize rather than integrate its black and white campuses. All display the functional modernism frequently employed in mid-century educational architecture. Archit Raleigh architect William Henley's Dietrich's firm rendered drawings for the 1951 gymnasium. Southern Pines architect Thomas T. Hayes Jr. Um, I guess, uh, sorry, um, exposed the modernist design principles promoted by faculty members. His name, his name sank firm and the successors designed nine buildings erected between 1955 and 1988 in an economical manner that allowed for rapid construction, flexible use and future expansion. The campus exemplifies the North Carolina Department of Education's initiative to supply students with spacious, well-ventilated and aptly lit instru instructional areas. The one-story, flat-roofed, brick-veneered buildings are characterized by angular form, horizontal massing, and tall, rectangular, still-frame, multi-pane windows. Utilitarian, resilient finishes, such as painted concrete block walls, rectangular, pastel-hued, glazed ceramic tile wainscoting, acoustical tile ceilings, and terrazzo, Ceramic tile and vinyl composition tile floors remain throughout the campus. The classroom addition, additions accommodated changing educational curricula and increased enrollment. Aluminum trim chalk and bulletin boards, built-in cabinets and bookshelves, and flat panel roof, veneer doors with glazed upper sections are intact. The kitchen supplied sanitary food service facilities while the cafeteria provide a spacious venue for meals. Here's a view of the combination administration building and library. Um, the auditorium and gymnasium hosted a myriad of cultural and athletic events and served as community gathering places. The 1966 auditorium has painted concrete block walls, acoustical ceiling panels, and steel frame wood seats. Ladder campus modifications include construction of a 1978 two-classroom two building in its 1988 expansion to the west with four classrooms. The, the classroom building erected at the campus west edge in 1990 accommodated pre-kindergarten instruction. West Southern Pines School became Southern Pines Elementary School when the Moore County Board of Education's integration plan was fully implemented in fall 1969. The campus operated a Southern Pines primary school from fall of 2001 until closing in December of 2020. Upon completion of the current facility at 1015 South Carlisle Street, a year later, the Southern Pines Land and Housing Trust prevailed in a two-year campaign to purchase the former West Southern Pine School, which has been rehabilitated to serve as the West Southern Pine Center for African American History, Cultural Arts, and Business. So West Southern Pine School possesses significance in the, at the local level under criterion A in the areas of education and Black ethnic heritage and criterion C for architecture. As noted earlier, the nine buildings erected on the West Southern Pine Schools campus from 1951 through 1966 manifest the Southern Pines Board of Education's effort to equalize rather than integrate its black and white campuses. All display the functional modernism frequently employed in the mid 20th century educational architecture and the campus is one of the most intact mid 20th century facilities, educational facilities in Moore County. The period of significance begins in 1951 when the gymnasium was built and ends in 1973. The school's function after that is not as of exceptional significance. Um, I also wanna note that we received CLG comments from the Southern Pines Historic District Commission and um, town council and both bodies unanimously support and recommend the nomination for listing. So. 
large complex. Any comments? Did um, OSA have any comments? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I kind of doubt it because of the two former buildings that were there or now built over. But I, I don't. I don't know. I don't recall. Parking lot. I'm sorry. You mean under the parking lot? Yeah. I'm. I didn't actually review or, or read the whole nomination, so I'm sorry. I don't remember if there were any comments. I don't. Do you remember if we got any on from more? I don't think they did, just because. In fact, there's been to at least the demo of the Rosa Mall School where the auditorium was. And then I think where the modern classroom buildings are, there may be potential there, but I'm pretty yeah. sure they didn't recognize. Yeah. We've been keeping OSA up. And yes, yes. <laughs> They're a little understaffed too, but yeah, I know they looked at it. I, since we seem to be go, going in twos, would we like to do I have a motion on these two these two properties? I make a motion. Can you approve? You second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, Sarah, you're up. <laughs> Okay. All right. So uh, this is another um, Claudia Brown nomination. I don't know what we would do without her. Um, so this is also, this is not, this is all Claudia's work. Um, so uh, this is uh, in Oxford, the St. Catherine of Siena Catholic Church. And let's see. All right. There we go. Uh, the building is located at the northeast edge of Oxford Central Business District, where the town transitions from commercial to residential and industrial use, institutional uses. Built in 1955 and sited prominently on a slight rise on a corner on a corner lot that is a little over a half acre, the church was placed on the study list in October 2018. St. Catherine of Siena Catholic Church, or simply St. Catherine's, is being nominated for its local architectural significance under Criterion C as a rare example of the Spanish eclectic style in Granville County. It is the only known example of the style applied to an ecumenical building in the three county region of Granville, Person, and Vance counties. Spanish eclectic is a generalized term that applies to a hybrid of mission and Spanish colonial revival styles. In St. Catherine's, the Mission Revival style is exhibited in the multi-curved parapeted front gable and the red tile roof at the arch um, at the arcaded entry, uh, while the cream, <coughs> cream colored brick exterior and arch windows on the side elevations are characteristic of the Spanish colonial revival style. As modernist style architecture grew in popularity for residential office and governmental buildings by the mid 20th century, especially in the state's larger cities, the, um, the application of, colonial, of Spanish eclectic was really limited in small cities, towns, and rural areas where other revival styles, often paired with pared down detailing, remained the most common styles for religious, religious buildings throughout the mid and even late 20th centuries. So let's walk around the building in a clockwise direction, beginning with the image at the upper left and proceeding clockwise on the screen. The north end of the at the north end of the main block behind the sanctuary and the two flanking wings contain the two flanking wings contain meeting rooms, offices, and a kitchen. The west wing originally served as living quarters for the resident priest. By the turn of the 20th century, Granville County had a small Catholic community. Lacking a church, communicants traveled to Henderson or Durham for services. And uh, when priests traveled to Oxford from Richmond, services would be held in private homes. Then beginning in 1942, services were held in St. Peter's Chapel, which was a, quote, mobile Roman Catholic church occupying a railroad car that was sidetracked approximately 1,200 feet from the site of this current building. 
By 1953, plans were being made for a permanent structure. The site was acquired, and in 1955, Greensboro contractor George W. Kane erected the church according to plans by Greensboro architectural firm Andrews and McGeady. These photos were taken during construction and shortly after completion. St. Catharines is nearly identical to two other Catholic churches in the state, the 1953 Our Lady of the Highways Catholic Church in Thomasville, and the 1933 St. Jude's Catholic Church in Grifton. Except for a square tower at the front corner of the church and decorative parapets on all four gables, the Thomasville Church, which is the one on the left, uh, was designed by James McGeady, is identical to St. Catharines. It's not known if he also had a hand in the design of the Grifton Church to the right, which was built 20 years earlier, but it's certainly notable that all three churches were constructed for Catholic congregations indicating that the plan may have been provided or approved by the regional diocese for adaptation to local churches. When the church, clo oops, when the church closed in 1993 with the congregation's merger with the St. Paul's Catholic Church in Henderson, all church furnishings and decorating, decorations were removed, none of which had been permanent fixtures. And that left a bare but otherwise intact interior distinguished by exposed roof trusses. Original tile floors remain under the carpeting, and the carpeting was added by other congregations that subsequently used the building. They also replaced original ceiling fixtures with chandeliers and fans, but the knotty pine paneling behind the altar is original, as are the strikingly vivid and modern stained glass windows, the result of an apparent collaboration between Father Joe Woods, who was the resident priest, and Aide Bethune, a Catholic liturgical artist based in Rhode Island, uh, and an as yet unidentified company from High Point that produced the windows. In this sampling, you can see that the designs employed symbols, lettering, and simple geometric shapes, um, apparently intended to minimize the cost of the windows, but it makes a pretty cool composition. Mm -hmm. When the first services were held upon completion of the building in 1955, the stained glass windows, furnishings, and decorative elements had not been installed, although the basic format of the windows was evident in the placeholder win windows, which had plain glass. By April 8, 1956, when the church was formally dedicated, all of those features were in place, including pan painted panels by Aide Bethune, which are shown in the photo on the right. Despite the loss of furnishings and minor exterior changes consisting of replacement vinyl windows in areas north of the sanctuary, removal of a cross at the apex of the front parapet, and removal of the statue of St. Catherine that occupied the garden niche in front of the main entrance, the building retains sufficient integrity to meet Criterion C for its architecture. It is significant at the local level and the period of significance is 1955, which is the year of construction. Uh, we'll also note that Oxford, as the cer certified local government, has expressed their support for the nomination. Any questions or shall I move ahead? I've got, I've got a question, but it's a rail car. I don't know. I would love to know, and I don't know. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, as an Oxford resident, um, that it's gone through several changes in terms of ownership, but that it, it you will I encountered folks who will say I used to worship there as, um, and I, they loved it and they said, I hope it's never torn down. Yeah. That kind of sentiment. And the other stranger thing, um, local folk, folklore, because I have not verified this um, yet, is that that was, that hill mm -hmm. was also, before the church was there, was where they would hang um, African Americans. Oh, goodness. Huh. So that's the part that is trickier to confirm that happened. I've heard it from one credible source, but she's no longer living. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. So it's, it's, yeah, it's just a piece of this interesting folklore. Yeah. I was just more curiosity <laughs> question. The, the white masonry wall up front of the mm -hmm. stairs kind of unique. Anybody know anything? I think I think that's where the statue of Saint yeah. Catherine was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that makes sense. All right. 
the urban building. Um, and this is one that y'all saw a study list for not too long ago, so it may be familiar. The urban building is located southeast of downtown Charlotte in Mecklenburg County. The seven-story building is eligible for the National Register under a criterion B for its association with developer Charles Urban. So here we are in Charlotte, and you can see downtown up in the top left corner. And then that's the boundary. Charlotte grew up at a crossroads of trading paths that put it at the center of commercial and economic development um, really throughout human history in uh, North Carolina. After World War II, the influx of returning soldiers, growing middle-class wealth and affordable personal transportation sparked suburban building across the country. One of those uh, veterans uh, who turned his eyes specifically to the Charlotte suburbs was Charles Irvin. Irvin was a native of Rutherfordton, and after serving in the Navy in World War II, he joined his brother in Charlotte with the intention to run grocery stores. Uh, but Irvin was also a mason by trade, so he started building his own home in Charlotte in 1947. But before he and his family could move in, another family made him an offer he couldn't refuse. So he sold the house and started building another house for his family. But the same thing happened, um, happened again. So um, that sort of um, uh, sparked him to uh, turn toward construction full time. And in less than a year before the end of, of 1947, he had founded the Urban Construction Company, hired 15 employees and left his brother's um, grocery business. So just eight years later, Irvin's company had grown to over 400 employees. And by 1955, the company ranked as one of the largest custom home builders in the country. As Charlotte grew exponentially between 1940 and 1970, so too did Irvin's business. In 1957, Charlotte's second most prolific builder, John Crosland, stated to the newspaper that he was planning to build 188 houses over the coming five years. By comparison, Irvin, who was ranked first on the list, planned to build 708 houses during those same five years. Uh, that's a gap of 520 houses between the, the city's top two home builders. Irvin organized his company to provide customers with everything they needed, including design, construction, engineering, surveying, financing, and even furnishing and landscape services. Most of his customers were white, but in, the in 1954, he also began building for African-American clients using his status as what was called an operative builder to have his Black subdivisions qualify for Federal Housing Administration loans. He also organized his subdivisions and businesses on his, around his own thoughts about the future and progressivism, and he was particularly influenced by Walt Disney and Disney's utopian vision of the future as presented in Tomorrowland. When Irvin needed a new larger headquarters building, the logical choice was a suburban high profile site along Independence Boulevard where tens of thousands of drivers would pass each day. Designed by the Charlotte firm Farabee Walters and Associates, the building opened in 1964 and displayed many of Irvin's ideas about togetherness and progressivism and innovation. Irvin's philosophies exhibited in the interior design of the building along with the location created a building that truly embodied Irvin as a developer of exceptional importance to, history, to the history of development in post-war Charlotte. Irvin continued to see great success in the 1960s, and Walt Disney featured three of his planned communities at the Carousel of Progress in Disneyland in California. But by 1970, things were changing. The company's growth was simply not sustainable, and American Siamed, a corporation, uh, American Siamed Corporation, bought Irvin in August of that year. And of Irvin's interest in progress and continual positive change. Other buildings and houses associated with Irvin do not convey, and more importantly, were not intended to convey Irvin's vision for Charlotte and, and for the future. The Irvin Building meets Criterion B for its association with a developer of exceptional significance in the history of Charlotte. Its period of significance extends from 1964 when the building opened to 1970 when, Irvin, when the Irvin Company was purchased. Yep. I have two comments on this nomination, neither which quibble with its eligibility at all, but one just I 
this would have been such a stronger nomination if it was also under C. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight into whether that was suggested? I don't know. Jeff, did you have any? I think when we did the study list, we suggested B and C. Um, it's a, sh I mean, especially it's, it's role on independence, which is part of the nomination, but the mm -hmm. nomination just doesn't focus on its architectural context, but bringing the modernism out of the downtown core, mm -hmm. establishing the independence boulevard corridor is sort of an extension of, of the downtown sort of typology and then the design and the local firm. I just feel like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have that in this nomination. I was sort of surprised when they came in with just the B argument, but you don't have to list it under everything mm -hmm. and listed it under one is listed. It's listed. Um, and I don't know, I'm guessing that um, there, there's a lot of modern, there's a lot of modernist stuff and a lot of post-war stuff in Charlotte. Um, it may have just been more expedient to do B alone. But. Okay. All right. And my only other comment would be that the nomination says it retains a high level of integrity. And that seems maybe like an overstatement. Yeah. I don't, do you have any? I mean, it's, you know, obviously there's signs of neglect, deferred maintenance, but I, I mean, I think general form, I mean, you still detect that it's, you know, vertical star protection. But yeah, I mean, hopefully, uh, what are the plans for the future are included with the paint, you know, stitch on, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, we will roll on. All right. Uh, Ridge Road School. This is another one that only recently went through the study listing process. So Ridge Road School is located in North Central Orange County. And here we have a soil map of Orange County showing you where the school is. Uh, and this is the National Register boundary for the school. The church you see just to the north is Jones Grove Missionary Baptist. And that served the Ridge Road community also. Uh, and it was established in the late 1920s, just a few years before the school was built. Uh, but the church that's there today dates from the early 1960s, and it's been significantly altered. In 1932, the Orange County Board of Education agreed to subsidize the construction of new, build, new buildings or additions that would create five one- to three-room schools for African-American students. Those schools were Merritt's, Ridge Road, Sunnyside, White Oak Grove, and Sartain. In the mid-1930s, the county added three more schools to this building program. So eight schools in total were constructed for African-Americans in Orange County in the 1930s. All were, simply all were simply finished buildings that followed standardized plans or slightly modified standardized plans provided by the State Department of Public Instruction. The board allocated $500 for the construction of a new Ridge Road School to replace an earlier building. For each of the five schools, the community members of the five original schools that they started with, I assume, I assume for all eight, but for, um, for those first five, community members were to supply the building's lumber. In the case of Ridge Road, the community also provided the land when farmers Walter and Maggie Torin made some land available for construction. Enrollment for the 1934-1935 school year totaled 80 students, of which 50, 51 attended regularly. By the late, 19, by late 1948, the average daily attendance had not really changed within, with 57 of 75 enrolled students attending regularly. This level of enrollment and attendance held steady for the school's entire functioning life. Bridge Road has suffered from neglect and has had some modifications, but in general, it retains good architectural integrity. Of those eight schools, one was brick and it still stands. One other remains standing, but has been radically and unsympathetically altered into apartments, and the other four have been demolished. In 1951, the county distributed Ridge Road students to Central High School in Hillsboro and to two new elementary schools, Cedar Grove and Eflin Cheeks. From that point forward, the Red Road School began serving the community as a gathering place, hosting civic meetings and educational programs. Eventually, eventually the Torrin family conveyed the property to Jones Grove Church. In conclusion, Ridge Road is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places under criteria A and C, 
in the areas of Black ethnic heritage, education and architecture with a period of significance covering the building's use as a school from 1932 to 1951. <clears throat> questions? Questions? Another okay. one where I was wondering if Alyssa had comments. They have comments. We have the Catholic Church, the Irwin Building, and uh, these roads. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like this would be potentially another one where there could be a D, even. Do we have like, like you're saying, doesn't affect this again? We have a nomination of motion. Move we support staff recommendations. Okay, support staff recommendations. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Right. We've moved the National Register nominations and it is time for lunch and we're going to be all a well-deserved break this night. We're going through the whole morning. I'll give you a little more break there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. When do you reconvene? What? When do you reconvene? Uh, it is 12 o'clock, so let's say 1230. Okay. Yeah. David. Thinking about the urban building, you think of 700 houses in five years. We have some property you know, in Charlotte. And uh, it's not the zone of the other day. I see it probably is pretty bad. But I think I'm going to spend my time. Wow. I'm
And that packet has a number of places that you need to sign your name, fill out forms, and get those turned in. That's the paperwork for the meeting today. There's a W-2 form. There is a uh, form for you to travel. But they're not going to figure out. Can I, I don't know how they're going to figure it out, but I believe you can Charlotte and came to Raleigh and go into courage. Off. <laughs> <laughs> I should have I should have put my address where I'm going to be the day after tomorrow, which is Canada. <laughs> I don't think the state's going to pay for that. Sure. Sorry, we're ready to start. Hey. So I'm starting off the study of applications for this afternoon. Uh, I have three to present to you today, so just settle in. <laughs> All right, so the first of the three study list applications I have to present is the Herbert A. and Ann Creef Senior House, seen here. So the Herbert A. and Ann Creef Senior House is located in Manio in Dare County. Here, there is a study listed uh, district in Manio, but nothing has moved forward with that. So it's located um, at 301 Budley Street um, in a residential neighborhood about a block from downtown. So downtown is kind of to the right this way. And the house is represented by the star there. Okay. The Kreef House was built for the Kreef family in 1940 and was designed by renowned Norfolk architect Alfred Loveland. Loveland was born in Kassel, Germany in 1904 and studied architecture and engineering at the Technische Hausschule, excuse my terrible German, um, in uh, I think it's Charlottenburg. When Hitler came to power in the 1930s, Loveland, who was Jewish, fled to first Paris and then moved to New York in 1936. In 1938, he married Mary Calverly, a former Vogue cover model, so very, very fancy, and they settled in Norfolk, Virginia. After receiving his architect's license in, Virgi in Virginia, Loveland established his own firm in Norfolk, but later partnered with architect John B. McGoffey to form Loveland, McGoffey & Associates around 1945. The firm grew quickly, establishing offices in Washington, D.C., Honolulu, Paris, France, and Ankara, Turkey. The firm designed domestic, commercial, and institutional buildings throughout the United States and internationally with an emphasis on modern design. This is examples of some of his and his firm's work um, in Norfolk specifically. Um, although Loveland died in a plane crash in the 1960s, the firm survived and currently operates under the name MMM Design Group. 
Loveland was heavily influenced by the Bauhaus style of modern architecture, which emphasized function design, functional design, simple geometric shapes, and authenticity of materials, particularly glass, steel, and um, concrete. You can see here, these are examples of buildings that were designed by Bauhaus trained architects. Um, this modern influence is evident in the buildings Loveland designed in Manio. In addition to his family home, um, Herbert Kreef, a prominent local business, businessman, uh, commissioned Loveland to construct or design two additional buildings, the Pioneer Theater, which is located like a block to the right, essentially, or I think that's east um, of the house. And that was recently restored in downtown Manio. And then also the Hassel and Kreef Motor Company, which is kind of a block in the opposite direction. So all, all on that Budley Street. All right, so now I will take you on a quick tour of the Kreef House, um, starting with the exterior. The Kreef House is a two-story concrete block vernacular international style house. It's clad in a brick veneer and features multiple panel casement windows with the exception of a glass block window on the second story. You can see in that bottom center photo uh, in the stairwell there, there's some glass block instead of a casement window. Um, the house originally had a flat roof, but a low pitch hip roof was added about 12 to 15 years ago due to roof leaks. Flat roofs in eastern North Carolina do not mix. And so they had lots of water coming in and they put this uh, low, very low pitched hip, hip roof on to help with that. The carport uh, was added, which you see here in this bottom right hand photo, was added in the 60s or 70s. And the jalousy windows that are on the porch up there in the top left hand photo um, were probably added about the same time. So this is the house. Uh, I tried to move in a sensical order, but because it has this kind of abstract geometric form to it, uh, it's hard to kind of get the whole thing in one shot, so. Okay, the porch features geometric metal brackets seen here in the center photo and a curved metal railing, which displays the um, Art Nouveau influences. So you kind of have deco and Nouveau going on at the same time. And both the front and the rear doors have, uh, have this like diamond etching in it as well. Very cool. Moving to the interior, which is incredibly intact, the plaster walls, oak floors, crown molding, mahogany doors and trim work, and many of the light fixtures are original to the house. This is the front hall when you first enter, which contains the main stairwell and that uh, metal railing is also original. So through an archway to the right is the living room. So um, again, everything in here is original to the house. Um, according to the current property owners, the fireplace had never been used. Um, they knew the family originally and according to them, that fireplace has never been used. It's been untouched since 1940. <laughs> And the, do the door at the far end there that you can see that metal door leads out to that um, enclosed porch with the jealousy windows. Uh, next to the uh, living room is this hallway that leads to a bedroom on the first floor. And again, all the doors are mahogany as well as the baseboards and the trim. And also there's a bathroom on that hallway, which is completely original tile, original fixtures, everything matches in, in like the 1940s, 50s way. Uh, from the hallway, main front hallway, you then pass straight through into the dining room. Again, very simply finished, plaster walls, oak floors, all your trimmings. And then from there, you pass into the kitchen, which has, again, all original fixtures, cabinets, countertops, the linoleum on the floors, all of it's still there. So it really hasn't been touched. Very cool. I love the matching tiles and the everything. Very, very coordinated. Um, you can then access from the kitchen, you can pass into the back stairwell, um, and this is the stairwell that is kind of the back stairwell. This is the rear door here, so it's all in this little area back here. And also from the back stairwell, you can access the garage that's on the side, which has a bathroom and laundry room for the creeps uh, live-in maid, and then also all this storage around the um, exterior walls of the, the garage. So moving to the second story, um, this is the second floor landing, which is accessible from that front stair. Uh, there are three bedrooms that are accessible from this stairwell. This is the first of them. They're all very similar in appearance, plaster walls, floors, everything's pretty much the same throughout the house. This is the second bedroom that's accessible from the opposite side of that landing. And this bedroom uh, has a connecting bedroom here, which was for the Creeps live, live in maid. Um, and this bedroom has two narrow closets as well as a laundry chute that goes down into that laundry room that's adjacent to the uh, garage. And this bedroom is also accessible from the back stairs, which is probably how she would have accessed this room. 
Uh, down the corridor next to that room, we have uh, two additional bedrooms. Again, they all look very similar to one another, but completely intact. And my favorite bedroom bathroom in the house, which is entirely pink and everything is original. Uh, the toilet to the sink to the bathtub. And uh, there's this glass block that's kind of a side light to the door to provide light both into the room and out. So. Uh, the Herbert A. and Ann Street Senior House is significant at the local level as a rare, intact, vernacular example of an international-style residence in Dare County. Architect Alfred Loveland blended the defining features of the international style with the more traditional sensibilities of his Eastern North Carolina clients, resulting in a unique regional example of the style. The house displays many of the characteristics of the international style, including the use of simple geometric forms, an asymmetrical facade, a flat roof, which, had, which it had historically, a uh, glass block and metal casement windows, and a general lack of ornamentation. However, the exterior lacks a stark geometry and large expanses of glass, often associated with high style examples. And on the interior, the modern design is tempered by the more traditional division of space, the use of plaster, crown molding, and dark stained woods. The Creep House also has a high degree of integrity and retains most of its historic materials, including casement windows, plaster walls and ceilings, oak floors, and bathroom and light fixtures. The side porch was enclosed with jealousy windows in the 1960s and 70s, and the carport was added about the same time period. But the main um, change to the building is the roof, that low pitch roof that was added about 12 to 15 years ago. Because it is, it is obviously changed to the house, but because it's so low pitched, you really can't see it unless this is taken from across the street. So unless you're across the street, you really can't see it. So it really doesn't affect the profile and the appearance of the house. Um, and is although it is a change that does affect its integrity, it, overall the house remains, maintains really, really good integrity. Um, so staff recommends placing the Herbert A. and Ann Creep Senior House on the study list for its potential significance under Criterion C in the area of architecture. That's the Creep House. If anyone has any questions. Well, relative to the unused fireplace, I grew up in a house that the same time, and my mother would never put a fire in the house. <laughs> so, something was going around back then, and that was the style. <laughs> okay. I have a fireplace, we're going to use it. <laughs> An ornamental fireplace. An or ornament, <laughs> ornamental. Yeah. Well, All right. So I'll move on to the next one, which is the Rocky Mount Municipal Power Plant, which I'm just gonna call the power plant because that's a mount. So uh, let's see, uh, the power plant was, I will note that the power plant was locally designated as a local landmark by the Rocky Mount Historic Preservation Commission in 2013. <clears throat> the power plant is located on the Nash County side of Rocky Mount. It's situated along the Far River uh, between River Drive and Sunset Avenue. The Rocky Mount Municipal Power Plant, now known as the Power Plant, was the city's second power plant, replacing the earlier lighting plant uh, located on Andrew Street. By 1907, the demand for electricity had grown, and a site was selected near the Tar River for a new power plant. The one-story brick building, seen in the bottom photo here, uh, was completed in 1909, and the facility was expanded again during the 19-teens and 20s. Um, and this is the Sanborn map from 1912. You can see the power plant in the middle. That's kind of the original extent of the building. Uh, circa 1924, a large two-story brick Georgian uh, revival style addition was constructed on the north and east elevations of the building. The 14,200 square foot addition was a full story taller than the original 1909 building in order to accommodate the new equipment necessary to provide power to the city's growing population. This photo shows the 1909 plant here. You can see it in the bottom. Let's see if I can use the mouse. So this is the 1909 section, that kind of lower story one here. And then you can see the 24 edition kind of rising up behind it. Um, and the water treatment plant is actually across Sunset Avenue from it. So that's what all this water and what you see kind of some of this is, is the water treatment plant in addition to the power plant. In 1946, a new five-story power plant was built to replace the original 1909 building. The 1909 section of the building was demolished in 1942 because it could not accommodate the 15,000 kilowatt turbine and five-story boiler needed to double the plant's electric output. The large smokestack on the east side of the building was also constructed around this time period. Uh, this is the 1923 Sanborn map, which was updated in 1949. So you can see the section that's labeled power plant is the 46 section. Um, and then the 24 sec 1924 section kind of extends behind it and wraps around in like an L shape. 
And then there are two uh, 1938 editions that kind of telescope towards the river on the back of the 24 editions. So that's kind of the extent of the building in 1949. And this is a picture that was taken after the 40, I'm not sure when this is from, but it's after the 46 edition was built. So the 46 edition is here on the right and then the 24 edition is on the left. Uh, by the 1950s, the power plant had reached capacity as a coal, and as a coal-fired plant, it could not keep up with the large steam electric generating plants of its competitors. In the early 1960s, the plant was converted to natural, natural gas in an attempt to remain competitive, but closed soon after in 1963. The building sat vacant for almost two decades until it was renovated into office spaces and a restaurant in 1985. And these are the photos that were from our survey files. These were taken in around 1975. So you can see that you'll see that the exterior of the building really hasn't changed all that much with the exception of the windows. The windows have been replaced. Um, they originally had these metal casement or maybe awning sashes, uh, but you can tell it's the 70s by the cars. All right, so this is an aerial image showing you the different phases. I know there was a lot of dates thrown at you. But this is showing you the different phases. Um, the 46 edition is in red here, and then the yellow section is the 1924 edition. Uh, and then the two blue sections are the 38 editions. And then there's also some 50s editions that were added in green there. And then the smokestack, which is off to the side here. Okay. So now we're going to take a tour of the building, starting with the exterior. The far left, uh, in the far left photo, the 1924 edition is the two-story section here next to the smokestack. And then the 1946 is the five-story section that's kind of on the left. Um, the 1924 edition features large windows with chamfered sills and jack arches with a stone keystone. There's brick corbeling above the windows, a high stone foundation, and a stone belt, cord, belt course and cornice. Uh, the 1946 edition uh, is much more streamlined and modern in its styling uh, with large windows and brick corbeling and um, concrete accents to echo the Georgian Revival style features of the 1924 section. Um, and like I said, the windows were replaced in the 85 renovation. Uh, this is a view of the north or the riverside in the top photo here, top right photo. Uh, you can see that a canopy and a deck have been added for the restaurant that's in the back section of the building here. Um, and this is your smokestack, which was built in 1946 or thereabouts probably. And then um, you have this really cool door, which I, I love. That's a very neat feature on it. So now we're moving to the interior of the building. Um, the interior of the building does reflect the 1985 renovations. So that's kind of unavoidable, uh, but the lobby section is open to the ceiling. So it does maintain that historic sense of space when you first walk in. Okay, let's see. And this is a mezzanine area, area on the second floor. Um, obviously this area has been enclosed, but you can see that the roof has been left or the ceiling has been left open and the bracing remains visible as well as this kind of winch crane thing that's also left visible. Uh, this is again moving up to the third floor. This is an office uh, in the bottom right hand photo is an office on the third floor which has this light well in the 1924 edition. This was left open during that renovation. Um, so that's a historic feature that's left exposed. And then also you have a view of again the exposed ceiling in that upper left hand photo. Uh, this is the top floor where there's this glass observation area in the executive offices. And again, just showing you the exposed ceiling as well as this kind of clear story window section that's on the 46th edition. Okay. So the Rocky Mount Municipal Power Plant is one of the earliest municipal power plants in Rocky Mount and, the and was a primary provider of electricity for the city from 1909 until the rise of investor owned utilities during the mid 20th century. Although most of the equipment has been removed, the existing plant building represents major periods of growth in Rocky Mount's electric service and reflects the city's rapid development during the early to mid 20th centuries. The power generated at the facility fueled the city's commercial and industrial enterprises, including Rocky Mount Mills, and supported the expansion of its residential neighborhoods. The power plant was altered during the 1985 renovations that converted the building into offices and a restaurant. The removal of the machinery, replacement of the windows, and the subdivision of the interior into office and retail spaces does compromise its integrity of association, feeling, design, materials, and workmanship. However, many of the building's characters defining features, including its form, brick exterior, uh, brick and concrete ornamentation, and large smokestack remain. Um, so according to the stylus application, this was an A and a C argument for its history and association with the development of the city and its electrical infrastructure. 
And the C argument centered around the Georgian postmodern and international styles that are reflected within the building. We reviewed this at staff review, and the consensus was that due to the extensive alterations to the interior of the building, um, that it no longer retains sufficient integrity to be a good candidate for the study list. So staff does not recommend that this be placed on the study list at this time. Are there any questions, comments? No, no plan. And Martin's. And the the clear story windows that we can see on the 46 block, are those original or were those part of the renovation? So those, the windows themselves are part of, let me get back. Um, the windows themselves are part of the renovation. And unfortunately I don't have great photos of that elevation because it gets blocked by this addition. I can't tell what's, this is the 75 prior to the renovations. I can't tell what's happening up here. Mm -hmm. And I can't really see what's happening. This looks to me like it was enclosed, but I'm not sure if it was ever fully open. If it was enclosed, then maybe that implies that it was open at one point and they just reopened it and put in new windows. Um, but that, I'm not sure, honestly, because I couldn't find good pictures of that, that little elevation of the building. So, then any, any other questions I can answer about this building? All right, I have one more for you guys. Hold on, let me get, get to it. All right. So the final study list application I have for you is Georgetown High School. Uh, Georgetown High School is a former Black high school located in Onslow County. The school is situated across the New River, uh, southwest of Jacksonville, an historically African-American community known as ja uh, Georgetown. Okay. Georgetown High School was established in 1908 by the Trent River Oakey Grove Missionary Baptist Association. The association, was, which primarily uh, was comprised of formerly enslaved persons, sought to empower future generations through education. The school was initially known as the Trent River Oakey Grove Collegiate and Industrial Training School, which is a mouthful. Um, but in 1919, the school officials deeded the land and the school to the county government for use as a public school for African-American students. In, 19, in the 1930s, the original school buildings were replaced by a new high school, which is seen here. Um, and despite the racial uh, disparities of segregation and overall lack of funding, Georgetown High School became a model for other local public schools and was the first accredited high school in Onslow County. The campus grew over the next several de decades, adding additional classroom buildings and a gymnasium. On the morning of May 29th, 1966, with graduation day for the class of 66, an explosion occurred in the gymnasium. The blast and ensuing fire severely damaged the gym and the adjacent classroom building. And the cause of the explosion, while the cause of the explosion is unknown, there is speculation that it was a targeted attack against the Black community in response to court ordered integration, which came down in 66. And the timing was that the explosion occurred at 3 a.m. and commencement uh, was going to happen at 3 p.m. that afternoon. So there's a lot of a lot of speculation, but no actual proof or no definitive ruling, I would say. Um, the school appears to have operated in some capacity until the 1970s or 80s, but by 82, several of the buildings on the campus, including the 1930s school building, have been demolished. The remaining buildings house the administrative offices for the Onso County Water and Sewer Authority. So now, aerials is the best way to kind of show you how the campus has changed over time. Um, this is the 1957 aerial of the campus. The extant portion of the campus is that L-shaped building you see kind of at the top left that's labeled classroom building. That's the largest section of the campus that's still extant. Um, you can see the gymnasium, which is where the explosion occurred, is connected to that building there. So that building presumably was damaged. The extant classroom building was damaged uh, during the explosion and the fire. There's some arched roof buildings um, that you can see below the gymnasium. Those were built in the 50s as well. And then below that, that kind of white looking outline that's kind of H shaped is the 1930s school. Um, and the next to that is an earlier classroom building um, that's adjacent to it. So this is the 57 aerial and then the 64 is grainy, but um, you can see the youth services building. It's this little kind of square that's off off to the side there was added a little bit later. This is 64. So it's two years before the explosion. And this is it after the fire. This is in 70, uh, 74. And as you can see, even after the fire occurred, the only thing that's gone is the gymnasium at this point. But this is what the campus looks like now. Um, so this campus 
has changed a lot over time. The red, red buildings are the original buildings that are still extant. You can see that L-shaped kind of, or I guess T-shaped um, classroom building there is still extant. The youth services building, which houses youth services for the Onslow County um, government is off to the uh, left and to the right, you have those arched roof buildings that I pointed out on earlier aerial. The 1930s school, as well as the earlier classroom building are kind of located towards the bottom of this image. They were in that kind of vacant now parking lot. Uh, so now I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of the school. Um, it's a really big, wide, long building. So it's hard to get a good picture of it. So uh, hopefully you can get a good sense of it here. Um, it's very much characteristic of a 1950s, you know, school building, um, flat roof, brick veneer, all of the windows have been replaced. Uh, so this is kind of the front elevation of it in the top left. In the top right, you have a side view coming around um, to where you see these arched roof buildings, which are probably depot, bus depot, or bus maintenance or something like that. Um, this white addition that you see here was added after 2018. So it's a 2018 to present. I'm not sure when that edition went in, but it was fairly recent. Uh, moving around, this is the side and the rear elevation. The top left photo shows you that kind of front projection that forms that L, which is where the main entrance is. And then you kind of come around to the back of the building in that uh, top right photo. The bottom right photo is that youth services building. Um, I'm not sure what that original purpose of that building was, but it was an auxiliary building that was built in the 60s. Um, and then the bottom left photo is the parking lot, as well as some additional buildings that the Onslow County has built on this site. And that was that's where the 1930s building and the earlier classroom building were located originally. Moving to the interior, uh, this is a view of one of the entrances, as well as the main lobby, which is very altered. And a view of the hallway and the main entrance, as well as one of the offices. Um, at the time that these photos were taken, the building was in use, obviously, by the county, and most of the classrooms have been converted into offices, so there aren't any really good pictures of the classrooms at this time. So, um, although uh, Georgetown High School is associated with the social and educational history of the Georgetown community, the loss of the historic buildings, alterations to the remaining structures, and the addition of modern buildings to the property have compromised its uh, integrity of setting, feeling, association, design, materials, and workmanship. And staff recommends that the school is not a good candidate for placement on the study list at this time. <clears throat> Sorry to end on a sad note. <laughs> it's just sort of sad yeah. because it's in the Gullah Beachy corridor, and that reference Georgetown, I mean, that's a name that you see in community Gullah and Geechee communities. Mm -hmm. And I would you wouldn't kind of know that or have that reference point by looking at what's what's left. Um, and if there had been something more intact, I would have said exactly. explore a little bit more mm -hmm. um, oral histories around um, that Gullah settlement, but so it's a wonderful, uh, when it was, uh, you know, intact, it told a wonderful story and it's still valued by the community. And um, obviously the people who reached out to us to do the stylist application um, love the building and it's still a kind of landmark within the community and the alumni association and other people within the community really uh, have done a great job preserving the history. There's interpretive signage, monuments, um, things like that. So they, they're very involved in, in and love this building. So um, even though we, we don't think it's a good candidate for the study list, it's a great resource and um, hopefully hopefully it'll be here. What's left of it can be here for many years to come to tell that story. All right. Do I have a motion on Eastern Region study list? Corona, there's a question across that. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to study this to start with the last one. We were talking about did I miss that? And what was that? that was one of the earlier ones. We haven't voted on that yet, um, but would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Nick Mallon, I'm the former chair of this committee. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to speak in support of placing the PowerPoint on the study list. Um, there's still a lot we don't know about that. We know there's been a lot of changes to it, but we'd like to do more research. Um, and I know the applicant put criteria A and C, and I know there's questions about that. Um, I own a building in Smithfield that I bought from the National Register, 
and it was the same question as Bill type uh, criterion A or C. Old 1858 Masonic building, and it was a wreck. It had been moved, and there were still questions whether it was qualified in the criterion C. Place on the study list to explore more. We found out that it was a, one of the first women's suffragette meeting houses in the South. So mm -hmm. I just would encourage the committee to consider placing on the study list so you can fully more explore this. The client is fully worried. There's no guarantee he's willing to explore more and spend time and effort to more explore the study. We don't know who the architect was. It's just a lot of information we don't know yet. We haven't been able to make that final criteria. So I'm just going to urge you to consider placing on the study. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have a question then because you, you, you brought this up. Well, you know, obviously, aware of the staff recommendations that it, that it not be study listed, but if we if we approve staff recommendation today and, and, and it's not on the study list, that doesn't preclude it from being reconsidered, does it? Um, I don't believe it does, but you can make an appeal. Yeah, you can certainly come back if you find more information. Well, if I may add, and I also having a previous career lived in Rocky Mountain, I do know how, how celebrated that was to mm -hmm. renovate and make that you know, preserve at least the exterior. Mm -hmm. Is there, can you speak a little bit to the local fervor around this issue, around the, you know, if there is any significant uh, push to, from the local leadership? For the I haven't spoken directly with the local leadership. My impression is it's a very beloved building. I think it's on a lot of um, memorabilia associated with Rocky Mount. There's pictures of it all over the place. And it's, it's very much a landmark it, beyond the landmark status, but it's very much a landmark in terms of, you know, it's right there on the river. It's so visible. Um, and I think it's one of those beloved buildings in town. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you know, sir, in terms of if there's any local Push for this, um, or well, it's a local landmark. Yes, so it's based on. I mean, exactly, it's considered it, but local correct. This probably considered significant enough. But yes. It's a local landmark and for a property tax, so that's a, something out of the community. Is mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, my question would be for staff: if, given what David has just offered, then there, there's there are more questions. Are there questions that you all would? Would want to have answered that could um, possibly change the recommendation because it looks like the, it sounds like y'all that there's this they want to really explore it more and if that's a possibility that new information. So staffs, I will say that um, in terms of history, there was a, a very well done local landmark designation report that was done. But as 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 uh, we've heard, there is additional information that we could gain from doing more research on the building um, to determine, you know, what features are original and what was, what it looked like um, on the interior. I couldn't find interior photos. It's one of the thing questions I had, um, what it looked like on the interior when it was before it was renovated. Um, but the staff recommendation based on our feelings at staff review was that the interior integrity was the question. So that we were all, as I'm sure we all were, we were all on board until we got to the interior of the building. And then uh, because that space has been so cut up and originally these power plants would have been like a mill building in that it would have been very open. So in terms of the changes to the interior of the building, it's that division of space and that loss of the sense of space on the interior of the building. Um, so it was those changes that made it so it, it couldn't communicate its history in a way that it would have originally, I guess would be the way to put it. Does so anybody else who was involved in that conversation want to make a comment about it was mainly the interior integrity that was the was the question here. Um, so whether or not there's a path forward, you know, I'm I, I I will give a personal opinion, not opinion of staff, but I do like the building. I think it's a great building. Um, but I do I do know the interior is a problem in terms of the changes. <laughs> yes. So and this is something we sort of struggle with on the Canadians' multi philosophical standpoint. The study list was established way back when because staff used to write the nomination list. So it was a way to weed out projects that were not worthy of staff's time. Through the years, it's evolved now the consultants do the work. So the risk is really on the owner to spend more money than it's on 
it worthy of national register. And we don't know that. I'm not standing here today to say that we think it's worthy, but we just need to plan the research. So I, for one, I'm going to put myself in a position to farm and put into the study list. As long as the owner knows the tricks, that's the point of the study list. Directly, they could do something to address the interior integrity issue. Depends on what, uh, like I said, I would want to see some documentation about what the interior looked like personally That's for the thing. renovations, and then also what was left of the original. Obviously, the ceiling and the and the roof bracing is still visible, um, but what other features are still intact, perhaps encapsulated within the later changes. Um, and in terms of whether that could be removed in a way that doesn't harm existing fabric, and also if it could be take quote unquote taken back to a state that would be acceptable. So that's those are all questions. I think there's still all also still an efficiency. So one of the questions we have is the end, we know the engineer record mm -hmm. where they're really interesting, innovative engineering systems that we designed for that we I mean, on that we could learn about and apply I think there's still an area for criteria. Yes. Uh, well, with criterion, criterion A, um, in terms of physical changes, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it's weighted differently um, than if you're going after a C argument. I, you know, the A argument is certainly the stronger of the two. Um, and with those physical changes, you still have an impact on its ability to communicate its history. Because when you, the exterior, I think still, the envelope is still there. It still says I'm some sort of industrial municipal building. When you walk into the interior, it does not, it doesn't read as a power plant anymore um, because of the changes to the interior. So that that's where the physical changes do have an impact on that A argument and have an impact on its integrity as it relates to its history. Um, but again, could that be something that's remedied? I, I won't speak to that, but I'm, I'm not an architect or an engineer, so I don't want to speak to that. But that is how integrity is coming into play. The changes of the interior are coming into play with that A argument. I'm on the fence on this one, honestly, given the, the additional information. I, I could go either way. I, I hear you on the, on the, my initial reaction was, yeah, this is a no-brainer. It's not with the, with the amount of integrity issues on the inside. Mm -hmm. But I could be convinced either way here. I don't, I don't, so I, I'm not sure what the way forward is. I, I personally would agree with the idea that further information can only benefit. And as long as it's understood that study list placement does not guarantee the original listing, there's a lot of intact interior still visible through the renovation. Um, the community really values it as a landmark. That all compels me to consider listing. In 10 more years in June. <laughs> <laughs> Just give it 10 more years. years. That'll, that'll be here. Here. In the 80s. We have the Eastern region up. We need a motion and we need it worded so you know exactly which what we're going with. Well, I'll make a motion that we accept staff recommendations for two of the three properties, that we accept the recommendations for the that's right. The Creef House and Georgetown High School, but that we reject, that's the right word, the Rocky Mount Power Plant. The, the recommendation, that is. Recommendation. Sorry, the recommendation, yes. Recommendation. Staff recommendation. <laughs> okay, do I have a second? Second. Is that wording indicating that that is just still open for further consideration? Or is that a recommendation? Sorry, we place it on the study list. Yes, okay. It's, it's going to be put on. Yes. That motion says, that uh, the Creek House, uh, Creel House will go on the study list. Uh, the power plant will go on the study list and Georgetown High School will not. That's correct. Okay. All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Opposed? Maybe I just have it. Breaking your track record for uh, I know she she spoke earlier this morning that she didn't know anything there was anything controversial. Okay, thank you. Here we go. We got you got Valerie and me in here, so you can you can guarantee. You're now to the Western region, but yeah. I've still got to keep my record of getting y'all out here by four. So, <laughs> Western region. 
Okay, so first we'll look at the Mountain View Regular Baptist Church, which is in Allegheny County, just barely is right on the line with Surrey County. Um, and it was first surveyed in 1981 as part of our comprehensive county survey of Allegheny, a very thorough and well done survey. And at the time, um, the, our surveyor recorded 23 churches in this small, sparsely populated county. 17 of them were Baptist churches of some stripe, either primitive, regular, like this church, or Union Baptist churches. So you can see there's a strong cultural preference for the rural Baptist church here in Allegheny County. Um, this very simple building is um, a great example of a type that's very predominant in the county. Um, of the 17 Baptist churches, I believe 15 of them are excellent comparison properties for this very simple front gable church. Um, and you can see so simple that it even lacks a belfry or a steeple of any kind, let alone any sort of dimensional aspect um, to the building itself. This building still has weatherboard siding. Um, it does have one over one vinyl windows that have um, that have come into the church in recent years. In 1981, it already had aluminum windows. So they had already been replaced at the time of survey. And you can see that it does have a fairly new metal roof and also the foundation has been underpinned. But otherwise um, on the exterior, there's the church sign. And especially on the interior, this church is very intact to its approximate 1907 date of construction. Here's another look at the stove. And um, you can see there's a, a very modest rear apse that is also very typical of these front gable churches in this part of the world. Um, the church has never received any indoor plumbing. So there are two privies on site. And there's also a cemetery here and the church uh, record book suggests that there was a cemetery here before a congregation um, amicably was dismissed from another regular Baptist church in Allegheny County and was sent to build a, a building here and create a separate congregation. And um, this church has not had a pastor or um, really any kind of formal church leadership for uh, many, for several generations now. And so the main function of this building and this site is to host the annual decoration day, which of course is another big aspect of mountain culture. And um, they do monthly <clears throat> acapella singing, which is um, part of the tradition that the regular Baptists took away from the primitive Baptist when they split over differences over predestination versus free will um, salvation. This church, as you can see, has a few issues that make us pause from an integrity standpoint. But when we compare it to, as I said, the other, you know, 15 to 17 comparison properties here in the county, it retains a higher degree of integrity than most of the, the churches that all would have been, you know, mirror copies of, um, of Mountain View in 1981 when our survey was done. And you can see the biggest change that we see on these Baptist churches is that the congregation wanted indoor plumbing. And so they put these vestibules on the front of many churches so they could have bathrooms on either side. And uh, Woodruff Primitive Baptist here at the bottom is the one where the form is the most similar to uh, Mountain View, but it is clad in vinyl siding now. And I will say that I had to rely on um, the website Find a Grave and also in one case uh, aerial photos to uh, kind of go through and see what had happened to the churches in the last 40 years. And then also I want to remind you that this church has uh, really excellent integrity on its interior. And in comparison, we have another regular Baptist church here in Allegheny County um, very similar on the interior, but you can see by the time this photo was taken that it had received that faux wood paneling that probably dates to the 1970s. So um, we believe that this is a very important building type that was demonstrated through our survey in 1981 and 40 years onward. It's either one of the best or perhaps even the best um, example, best able to represent an important building type and the 
uh, design material and workmanship that went into this, um, this strong cultural tradition for Allegheny County. So we do recommend placement on the study list as a um, potentially eligible under Criterion C. Any questions? I, what year did you say that the regular split from the primitive? I do not know. Um, I do not know what year approximately that would have happened, but I think in the 19th century, the really strong Calvinist leaning of the Primitive Baptist Church was too much for some of the people who were attending services there. And they still they still found valuable the um, the tradition of a cappella singing, the way that um, the way that the ministry was conducted, but they wanted the opportunity to be more missional to their neighbors because the primitive Baptists believe in the elect mm -hmm. and, you know, very strongly that all the father has given me are mine. And so really no need to do any missional outreach because you're either predestined to be saved or you're not. And so the regular Baptist, the main issue was they said, we believe we can reach out to the community and save more people. And the primitives said, well, no, like the, the elect has been preordained. How many, how many regular Baptists? There are three, there are three in Allegheny County. Um, just doing some Googling, I believe there's only one seminary where you can be trained to be a regular Baptist. Um, and I think it's in Missouri, but I don't believe I don't believe any of the regular Baptist churches in Allegheny County have a called minister. I believe they're all folks who um, either grew up in the church or they have grandparents who were part of the church. And so they observe the monthly singings and the decoration day. But there's not any um, there's not a regular worship service on Sunday mornings. Well, it looks very similar to a lot of the primitive Baptist ones in the East. Absolutely, it does. And um, one of the differences, and I'm not sure how much significance to put on it, is that there's just the single door versus many times you see the double doors. Yeah. And I don't really know, I really don't know what the significance to put on that at this point. But um, I would also note that the Library of Congress, um, the American, uh, the Archive of American Folklore, this is the Library of Congress, sent field workers to Allegheny County in the 70s and 80s to record um, the both the primitive and regular Baptist um, tradition. So it was, you know, recognized as being a place where you could still study that old culture and record it at that time. And that's actually where this photograph came from, Celebrate Congress photo. And if you are interested in hearing the music, it's on their website. So I listened to it while I was making this PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good research. That's right. Getting that integrity of feeling. <laughs> All right. And then our second property is the Pine Burr Mill in Valdez. And you may remember that last year, I think at the October meeting last year, we had the results of the Valdez Comprehensive Survey that Audrey Thomas, um, our survey specialist in the Asheville office, presented to you all. And at that time, we decided to place the um, Alba Waldensian Historic District on the study list. And that is comprised of four associated mill buildings that were part of the Alba Waldensian um, hosiery mill. And um, we also mentioned at that time that there was a discontiguous mill building that was associated with um, these four that are there in a cluster. We did not have access during Audrey's survey to this mill complex that circled in red, but it has been sold since that time. And the new owner um, gave Jennifer Caffey in our office full access to the site and submitted a study list application. Um, so although we were not able to discuss it at, at last year at this time, we now have a lot more information about it. Um, so here is an aerial of that area that I circled in red. And as you can see, like so many of our mill buildings, it grew and changed a lot over the window of time in which it was active. This um, is about three and a half acres that you're seeing here. And it started in 1923 
um, as the home of the Valdez Shoe Corporation. It was built speculatively, and the Shoe Corporation is the business that used the space first. But by 1931, it became part of the Waldensian Hosiery Mills. So it entered into that historic context that we associate with um, what would become Alba Waldensian and is part of that historic district. Um, we would expect a period of significance for this would be something like 1923 when it was first constructed up to 1970 or even a little later because the building was in continuous use and it continued to evolve responding to innovations in mill technology during that period. Um, the uh, Waldensian Hosiery Mills was started in 1901, and by the late 1930s, um, approximately around the time that they took over this site, it had become the, uh, the chief industry in Valdez, and it really did not have a rival in terms of being a major employer and a major output of that town. Um, from the beginning, they produced hosiery, and over the years, as, as markets would change, they added things like women's underwear and girdles and garters and things like that. But they, they always had hosiery as their chief output. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, Waldensian was one of the US's largest manufacturers of men's and women's hose and undergarments, um, particularly women's sheer stockings. And they, because of their, the tremendous amount of trade that they were doing in this area, during the 60s and 70s, they also occupied an office in the Empire State Building, but otherwise all of their office and manufacturing took place in Valdez um, or in nearby Lenore. And this, these are some shots of some of the exterior, including the, um, the concrete block storage building. And then here the interior are very typical, very much what you'd expect, um, but intact to that period when the machinery was taken out. Um, like many mills, over time, the windows changed and in some parts of the building were blocked in. But again, all of that happened during the um, presumed period of significance that does extend to um, the 60s and 70s because that was um, its era of major importance in the US market. And so, um, Staff recommends that this uh, mill would be potentially eligible under criterion A for industry, much the same way that we found um, the other discontiguous aspects of the Alba Wadensian company were, were worth study listing um, in a slightly different part of town. Comments, questions? Sarah? All right, so we're going to head even farther west. Um, Franklin was created in 1829 to serve as the county seat for Macon County, which the General Assembly had created the year before. The town is situated at the Nequasi Mound, the Cherokee Mound along the Little Tennessee River. In this photo, the river and the mound will be directly ahead downhill. The application describes the district as representing a significant and distinguishable entity associated with commerce and government and possessing a significant concentration of buildings united historically by physical development. Indeed, downtown's historic significance is not in question, but the committee will need to consider the potential district's integrity. Uh, so Franklin and Macon County are uh, in the far western tip of the state. And the proposed district boundary is outlined here in white. The boundary is proposed as following parcel lot lines, and so it goes um, behind some buildings and includes parking lots. Uh, the study listing process does not have to create a firm boundary, but staff would suspect something more like this would be realistic. Um, at a future nomination, if it gets study listed and if it moves forward, 
might extend to um, might extend the boundary in these two locations circled in red. Fittingly, it's the seat of governance and commerce in Macon County. The proposed district is bookended by the 1972 Macon County Courthouse at the district's west end and the 1935 U.S. Post Office on the east end with commercial buildings and two hotels in between. Another notable feature is the vestige of the courthouse square, which was really a rectangle uh, with the courthouse in the middle of the northern half of the square. Today, a Confederate monument occupies the southwestern corner. The bell tower of the previous courthouse stands on the southeastern corner. And then uh, there's a bandstand and what used to be a fountain designed to match the 1972 courthouse on that northeast corner. The courthouse today is situated on the northwest corner. Architect Kyle C. Boone designed the building in the new formalism style. Boone was a Washington, D.C. native who practiced in Asheville beginning in 1963. His work includes the Canton Municipal Complex and Town Hall and McDowell County, McDowell County Administration Building and the North Buncombe High School. Immediately to the west of the courthouse is an altered 1920s building. That's the little white building you can see the edge of. And then the 1952 Natahala Power and Light Building. And then just a little farther west are these two commercial buildings. And in the same block on the south side of the street are these two buildings. So like almost every single building in this district, these buildings have seen some pretty notable alterations. But if a nomination were to move forward, um, I, I would expect these buildings to be considered for inclusion. I don't, I don't know that they are any more altered than anything um, else in the district. So moving back to the square, and now we're facing, um, we're looking east along Main Street facing the north side. We're looking at the buildings on the north side of Main Street. The streetscape remains certainly, but um, hard awnings and replacement windows are present um, on a lot of buildings. The tall building in the center is the former Scott Griffin Hotel. And this picture was made before, sometime before 1941. And we know that because the current Wells Fargo building, which is located where that yellow arrow is pointing, uh, was built in 1941. And here's that Wells Fargo building today. The other buildings to the right of the Wells Fargo building are also, um, I believe, to be 1940s. Now we're across the street. This is the south side of Main Street. So the square would be to the photographer's right or, or back, kind of back right, I guess. Um, let's see. The building at the center of this picture with the combination of bricks was the Jarrett Hotel built in 1894. This building originally had a two-story porch that extended over the sidewalk. Stone was added to the facade in 1976 as part of a project called the TVA Town Lift Program. Uh, and learning more about the TVA Town Lift Program and what that was and how it might have affected downtown Franklin is something that, um, that a nomination investigator would need to dig into and potentially really address in, in a nomination. Uh, the facade to the right of this building has also had some stone facing, but um, it's unclear when that happened. So continuing down the street from the Jarrett Hotel, uh, there's a building covered entirely in stone. And uh, as best I could determine from some photographs, it, I think it, that stone was added before 2008, but sometime after the mid-1990s. So it's not as, not as old as the TVA um, project. Continuing along Main Street, the two concrete buildings, uh, concrete block buildings to the right, uh, they did have elaborate decorative parapets that were removed at some point in, in their history. I, I, I don't know how long those um, stayed up there. And then finally, as you come to the end of the district, uh, you get to the 1935 post office, which is a, a really lovely building. So in 2019, staff made a visit to Franklin and did not feel at that time that the town retained the integrity necessary for listing in the register. Two weeks ago at our staff review meeting, um, I would say feelings were a little more uh, ambivalent with kind of the consensus, the consensus being that the district would not be a strong candidate for the register because of its low integrity of design, workmanship, and materials. 
If a nomination were to be written, however, it would require great attention to the changes made to these buildings and a strong argument about how the district could convey its, its significance as a commercial and governmental center for Macon County in spite of a significant loss of integrity. So that's sort of a non-recommendation for you. <laughs> Enjoy, frankly. <laughs> Any questions? So the in 2019, the decision was made based on a survey, and then in 2023, this is based on no, stuff. No, in 2019, um, the town or someone from the town, I'm not sure who, had approached our office. Annie McDonald was in our Western office at the time yeah. uh, and talked to Annie about it. And uh, when I was up in Nashville at some point with her in 2019, I think Beth went with us, too. Uh, we went went out to Franklin and took a look in person and um, just did not think it had enough um, stuff left. Um, so. Did you find any buildings that you thought, you know, make, might do for individual? No, we specifically went in the hotel, the, the taller hotel in the middle. Um, that was undergoing some renovation right then already, and um, the interior had been pretty well gutted. It just didn't retain anything outside or inside um, to list it individually. What about the post office? I have not been. Have you been in the post office? I can't say for sure, but I have. I have not. There are, there are quite a few things in Franklin that are individually study listed. Yeah, it might be it might be individually study listed. I'm not sure if the post office is one, but I know that when you look at the map of what Franklin on HPO web, there's a lot of green study list stuff that she's never moved. Mm -hmm. But not really much like downtown proper. No. Yeah. <laughs> I know you want it to be, and it's got that great view, and you know, you want to go for it, but Okay, next stop, um, presenting Seven Gables, also historically known as the Frank and Del Huey House in Shelby. Shelby is the county seat of Cleveland County. Um, seven Gables is approximately seven miles east of Shelby's central business district, indicated here with the red pin. The surrounding area is primarily residential, bordering curvilinear streets and subdivisions platted from the 1920s through the mid 20th century. Seven Gables is situated south of Cleveland Springs Estates, platted in 1926, uh, east of the former Cleveland Springs Hotel site um, that was opened in 1921 and burned in 1929. And the house is actually within the Cleveland Park development, which was platted by the landscape architect Lee Collier on 38 acres. The developments in Cleveland County Country Club flank East Marion Street with nine holes of the 18 hole golf course on either side. Seven Gables is an expansive Tudor Revival style residence situated near the center of a roughly two acre parcel. The sizable lot provides an appropriate setting keeping with the dwellings estate like character. The house faces northwest, shielded by vegetarian from East Marion Street, a heavily trafficked thoroughfare. And this image is actually a Google Street View shot um, from December of 2016, um, because all the vegetation, it's really hard to see the house on the road. And I wanted to um, show you kind of the expanse of the, of the lot there. And all the rest of the photographs um, in this presentation are from June of this year. Seven Gables was erected by Frank and Del Huey. They met and wed in 1916. He was a native of Shelby and became manager and partner at the Cleveland Drug Company after graduating from UNC Chapel Hills Pharmacy School. 
He had diverse entrepreneurial interests, including real estate and partnering in 1919 for the Studebaker dealership. He was also, also a nephew of Clyde Huey, one of the men that made up the Shelby dynasty, a group of high political leaders for the state and U.S. Congress. Frank and Dell purchased lots one and two of the Cleveland Park in May of 1925, and they sought out architect Franklin Gordon to render drawing, drawings for the house that emulated an English country estate of the Tudor era in June of 29, and they occupied the home by December of that year. In 1935, there was a fire while the family was away, and though the structure remains, areas with little damage were ruined by water and smoke. It was thought to have been caused by defective wiring near the kitchen um, and furniture was ruined and some of the family items were saved, including drawings for the house. So here's an overview of the property. <clears throat> an adjacent lot to the east was purchased in 1936 for additional outdoor events and space. The garage apartment served as a painting studio for their daughter, Eleanor, and a stable was erected for her pony. <clears throat> um, this small one-story addition to the West was constructed in 1970 and it's circled here in red. The asymmetrically mass two-story Tudor Revival style dwelling is distinguished by its seven steeply pitched half-timbered gables, <clears throat> name, although the entire exterior, including copper gutters and downspouts, were painted a cream color circa 1970 material contrast is still apparent. There are original double hung encasement windows, entry doors and hardware, storm doors on the east and rear entrances. Exterior modifications around 1970 are minimal. The front entrance vestibule was enclosed with glass, a treatment that was reversed in August of 2023. So again, these photos are from June and we'll see a number of things that have changed since then. I think the house was purchased in May of this year. So the new owners are wanting to renovate and take some things back. <clears throat> this is an ugly front view moving around the house to the east end porch. Um, in the south main entry and view from the pool to the southwest wing of the house. And here's the connection between the 1929 portion and the 1970 addition. So um, I don't have a pointer, but this window here on this little like enclosed porch is that window there. So you can kind of see how it um, wraps around in the back on the side. Um, the addition is similar in character with running bond wire cut brick and half timbered stucco gable. And here are some details from the front facade. Um, there you can see where it was enclosed. And you'll see another picture from the inside um, as well, but has now been opened back up. The glass is no longer there. Some other details from um, the side porch and rear entrance, original features such as the light and the railing. Um, here's the 1950 pool with some updates made in 1970 renovation and the circa 1930s stable. Here's the circa 1930 garage apartment. And these are photographs taken of the original blueprints and converted to black and white images of the front and rear elevations. Here's the first floor plan. Um, we'll look at the interior and sections using the floor plan as a guide because you can see there's a lot going on. <laughs> So here we are um, in the hall. Interior and tack finishes include oak floors, smooth plaster walls and ceilings, wooden plaster cornices, baseboards and chair rails, windows, door surrounds and hardware. Plaster walls beneath the chair walls were painted to emulate wainscoting and paper was above. So entry hall features were changed, including two arched openings, widened and squared off around 1970, indicated here with the red oval on the plan and also the enclosed front entrance, which is indicated in orange to show it has since been opened and changed back to its original use.
The living room and sun parlor arched egresses are enclosed in 1970 to form bookcases and have since reopened as indicated by the orange ovals on the plan. The yellow ovals indicate original unchanged features, including mantle and fireplace surrounds with full height panel pilasters and fluted capitals, as well as the two arched opening exterior doors to the east porch and the windows. The Sun Parlor's 1970 bookcase enclosures have been reopened to the living room. Vertical panels were removed in August, revealing two sections of three original panels flanking the fireplace. Matching panels will be crafted and slim bookcases reconstructed. All the windows are original and painted metal screens disguise the radiators recessed beneath the windows, and you'll see this throughout the house. <clears throat> Moving to the west side of the hall, is the dining room, breakfast room, and service area. Again, the red ovals indicate the changes made in 1970, including the removal of um, some cabinets for a larger breakfast room um, there in the plan on the top right. And there you can see on the right photo is the, um, the breakfast room where there's still some original, um, <laughs> uh, ca original cabinets and drawers that, on the wall that leads to the kitchen area. Um, the yellow ovals, again, indicate original features, including the service area with the bathroom and staircase and original exterior doors that now lead to the 1970 addition. And here are a couple photos of that one room addition. The kitchen has been remodeled several, several times, yet the arrangement of doors and windows remain the same, as well as the closet or butler's pantry and enclosed porch. Nothing of note has changed with the basement plan. And here are some photos, um, sample pictures. There are plenty of the basement, um, just some storage shelves and things of that nature. And there was a toilet area and um, a sink down there, I'm, I'm guessing for um, helpers, staff of the home. On the second floor, all areas are original except two places indicated on the plan. One bathroom was remodeled and a sitting area was, in, was closed off and converted into a dressing room in the 1970 renovation, which has now been opened back to the hall. And this is that room there with the sitting room converted to the dressing room with the zigzag closets that have been um, removed and the open back up to the stairwell, the upstairs hall. Other bedrooms and bathrooms retain original features. Here's the southeast bedroom and bathroom. I don't know how that left picture is still there. And the northeast bedroom. Some beautiful interior features. <coughs> Another original bathroom upstairs um, is all original except a new pedestal sink. Comparable properties that we, have, that we have in our database searching with the term Tudor in Cleveland County include the Summers House, which might look familiar. It was listed in Kings, from, it's in Kings Mountain and listed in 2021 as the top right photo. Um, it is large, but not quite in an estate like setting. The bottom two photos are contributing um, buildings in the Shelby's West Warren National Register Historic District. And the top left Pruitt House was deemed ineligible in the north end of the county. Um, the best comparable property is likely Vox Hall, and it's just up the road from Seven Gables. However, additions in the 70s, 80s, and 2003 have expanded the now occupied Fish East restaurant to be 24,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And the main Tudor house portion is actually not used, I think it's storage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice storage house, right? Um, so in conclusion, staff recommends placement of seven gables on the study list potentially at the local level of significance for a criterion C in the area of architecture and potential periods of significance of 1929 and 1935. Um, and I also want to note that the applicant sent the study list application um, to the C Cleveland County Historic Preservation Commission um, as a courtesy. Don't usually have to, don't have to do that for study list. 
And, and they shared their thoughts with us and the CLG, um, as a preservation partner in the board, they felt that it deserved consideration of the study list. You said this was uh, Bob Hoy's nephew? Yes, his nephew. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe he was governor. Governor and U.S. Senate, he died in the Senate. Yeah, a, lo a lot of um, Shelby folks, men were um, local and then state senators, sometimes governors, congressmen, um, so real powerful political leaders there. Probably the dynasty. The dynasty, yeah. that's right. The dynasty. <laughs> Any other questions about Seven Gables? So, um, you know, excited to see, obviously the nomination would have to have a lot of new photographs and things of that nature, um, anything that would change since that time. And you said that the new owners want to take things back. Yeah, so I mean, it seems, yeah, they've already made some changes and, you know, opening up like the beautiful paneling that used, used to be there. They want to like recreate that in the sunroom. Um, I haven't personally talked to, the owners where that was part of, of the application. And they um, they are gonna be moving forward for a local landmark status as well. It's not a local landmark, it's not study listed. I was sort of surprised by that. Um, but yeah, so, and hopefully um, paint job on the exterior might look a little different as well. <laughs> I don't know what it originally was like. I don't, um, I don't have any color photos. There was just a drawing um, rendered like a, Pen and ink drawing from a while ago. So I didn't include that one. They've already opened up the front entry. Yes. They've opened up the front entry. So it's not the little terrarium. Um, <laughs> there are some funny things that were done for sure. Yes. Yeah. All right. Moving on to your, the next one. The next one Marshall High School. So Marshall High School um, on your agenda it just says boundary increase but and in, in looking at it it's probably um also additional documentation would be needed but that's not necessarily something that you have to vote on per se for study list but i thought i would just add it into my presentation i get a splatter here oh yay buzzing um so <laughs> next up the marshall high school boundary increase um located in madison county so we're far west again. Um, Marshall was about 30 minutes north of Asheville, and the former high school is located on an island, which is surrounded by the French Broad River, indicated there with the red pin. Marshall High School was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2008. The blue outline and shaded area in the is the National Register boundary with the gymnasium to the west of the former high school. Though the gymnasium was built within the period of significance for the listed nomination, it was not included at that time due to ownership objection. So the high school was owned by someone different from the gymnasium. I guess it was sort of like other nominations we've seen that it was like, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be included. There is a little hazy about exactly why, because, um, but here we are now. <laughs> Marshall High School was built in 1926 and almost immediately upon completion, there was discussion about the need for additional classroom space and a gymnasium. Here's the front and rear of the high school. But it was not until 1950 that the Board of Education approved the selection of architect Lindsay Gudger as to, to design the gymnasium building. A bond vote was passed for the construction of the gymnasium in 1954 and completed in 1956. It was not only in use for athletic events and classrooms, but for some other community events as well. Here's the proposed boundary increase area for the gymnasium indicated with a slightly darker dashed line. You see it on the left-hand side there. And the proposed study list boundary increase does not include the former ball field to the west of the gymnasium, um, you can see it as a slight shaded curve of the former field and lights on the adjacent parcel. So um, just beyond that pink line there, you see the little arch. There's little integrity left of the former field to be included in the boundary increase. And these are the floor plans of the gymnasium with the top of the drawings facing east towards the high school 
The lower level has classrooms and locker facilities, while the upper level is mostly just the gymnasium and the enclosed stairway vestibule. So here we have the east facade of the gymnasium facing the, the back of the school with entries in the upper level opening directly to the gym. And we're gonna walk around the building. Um, here's the seven bay south elevation with an off center chimney and original windows. And this is the west elevation facing the ball field. And here's a view of what's left of the field. So just mostly a grassy area. <laughs> And here we have a view of the north elevation, again, with the seven bays across and original windows. Here we have the interior of the gymnasium with exposed metal trusses and painted concrete block walls. Due to previous roof, a roof leak, a small portion of the floor has buckled, but the remainder is in good condition. You can see it just a tiny bit on the bottom right there. Um, there's another picture up close, but it's not very much of the floor. Here's some photos of the, of the entry lobby vestibule and stairway down to their lower level. This is the first floor lobby and locker room area. In recent times, the building has withstood floodwaters with, with the only known damage to have been an influx of mud into the lower level. Some photo examples of four classroom spaces and a utility room. The Marshall High School Gymnasium is significant for its contributions to the education and community history of Marshall. It is also an excellent example of a 1950s school architecture. The only changes to the building appear to be window glazing, some of which are cracked or replaced with plexiglass. The gymnasium construction date of 1956 falls within the period of significance of the Marshall High School National Register nomination, which was 1926 to 1957. The high school and gymnasium remained in use as a school facilities until a, high, a new high school was built in 1973. Um, so that's for, therefore, that's why I was thinking it also needs um, some additional documentation to potentially extend that period of significance through 1973. The high school has been converted to art studios and the current owner has plans for the gymnasium to be converted to community use with lower level spaces converted to offices and art studios. Staff recommends the Marshall High School additional documentation and boundary increase for placement on the sleep study. Any questions? So we have a right on the Western and then we'll take a break. I think we just have to, we've got clear staff recommendations on four of the five, but the district in Franklin, I'll just throw out that it seems very clear that there are a lot of integrity issues, but there was also a little crack of the nomination potentially dealing with that 1970s era of renovation that it seems like there is a little crevice for someone to try to make an argument. And based on that, I would say, we could put it on the study list and give them that challenge. As long as the sponsor clearly understands the check. Yes, which I would imagine this will be part of the record. So you would like to, you're suggesting we change the uh, title from a no to yes. Right, well, this, there wasn't a no, there wasn't a clear no, it was ambiguous. So I guess I would be moving to list all five study list for the Western region. Are you making that as a motion? I would move to do that. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? You know, fast, and we'll take a short break here, because all of us need to stretch a little bit, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Closing entryway on the sad house. Is that glass? That's the issue that's still in the way there. It's a different change than I have a front door. No, I think. Also, it doesn't have those 1940s photos of Main Street. They all have awnings. The awnings are not. 
definitely changed the story. Yeah. And hard on these in. They tended to be those flat people. Um, um, you no, know, I still love them. Yeah. Yeah, the UNC one falls out. I've been pretty well tuning out that buzz. You know, I, I'm starting to, like, if, yeah, I was starting to go, okay, where's the current from and how do I stop those? You know, you know, it,
Country School is located in Franklin County, and you'll hear me say Crossroads School and or Crossroads School. It shows up both ways. I don't know which way is really the right way. Uh, but anyway, Franklin County is located northeast of Raleigh and Wake County, and the school itself is located in north central Franklin County, just northeast of Lewisburg. Um, here's the site with school. Uh, the Crossroads School appears to have been constructed around 1927 for African-American students. 1927 is the year Britton and Laura or Sarah, and I'll come back to the name difference. Uh, Britton and Laura Williams sold three acres of land to the Franklin County Board of Education. Britton Williams was an African-American man who was born to Britton Williams Sr. and Chancey Williams in Franklin County around 1865. Britton Jr., the, the one who sold this land, seems to have made his first land purchase in Franklin County in 1899 when he purchased 51 acres from a man named Frank Williams. Britton's wife's name is spelled as Sarah on deed records, but recorded in the census as Lara, basically Sarah with an L. Uh, but then it's recorded on her grave marker as Laura. So I'm going to use Laura because I figure that's what her um, family used. <laughs> Um, sometime after 1910, but before 1930, Britton Jr. and Laura moved to Warrington. Britton died in 1944, followed by Laura in 1945, and they are buried in the old Warrington Cemetery. Britton Jr. is referenced in one 1891 newspaper article as a member of the Franklin County School Board. According to Robert Taylor, who was a former student at Crossroads School, uh, he provided information to an investigator in 2017, and he recalled that the school housed grades one through seven. Grades one through three were in one room, and grades four through seven were in the other. The school closed in 1949. Um, our office had recorded this building as a potential Rosenwald school, and indeed, it certainly follows a two-room Rosenwald uh, to a T. However, no one's been able to find records of a Rosenwald known as Crossroads School in Franklin County. 14 Rosenwalds were built in Franklin County, and five of those were two teacher buildings. Investigators speculated that maybe this building had been moved to this location. Possibly this was Wilder Grove School, which was also a two teacher Rosenwald that um, historically looked like this one. Um, However, deeds show that the school built the school board bought this specific parcel. It's still on the same parcel, um, this specific parcel in 1927. And the 1952 deed in which the county is selling the school to a private owner mm -hmm. describes the building as the Crossroads Colored School. All of that suggested suggests the building was constructed here and was always um, always here. And. Um, Sorry, this is a, a little bit older version than um, than what goes quite exactly with my script, but we'll get to some 1930s maps that also show the school was apparently always here. So all of this suggests that Crossroads was not constructed with Rosenwald funds, but it was clearly built using a Rosenwald design. Thus, declaring the school to be a Rosenwald depends on one's definition of a Rosenwald. <laughs> um, aside from the school's um, or from the building's status as a Rosenwald, one way or another, uh, the school should be considered historically significant for its association with the history of education in Franklin County, as well as for its association with African American history in Franklin County. So, essentially, it's historically significant, separate from Rosenwald. Uh, and then that leaves us with the question of integrity. Does the school look like it did when it was operating as a school from about 1927 or 28 until about 1949? Um, so we'll look at some, uh, some pictures. So this is um, the kitchen is in the industrial um, room, which is at the front, the little projection that sticks out. Um, in these two pictures, you can see some uh, original floorboards and um, some original beaded board on the in the room on the left. Um, here's the 1931 soil uh, map, and then a 38 state highway map, both showing uh, the little school symbol there. There are only three schools listed on the register in. Um, in Franklin County, one of them, and all three of them are African-American schools. Um, this is the Perry School, which is one of those listed in the register. And then Concord School 
And the third one is in Lewisburg and it's very dissimilar to Crossroads. It's not really a useful um, comparison. So Crossroads School is historically significant, but in staff's opinion, there have simply been too many alterations uh, that have occurred to the building for it to be considered a good candidate for study listing. Yes, the, the Rosen Law, uh, when we were doing some research on the building, we found that there were some St. Louis, uh, excuse me, New Orleans plans that are very similar to Rosen Law that were in use of buildings prior to the Rosen Law stabilization of plans. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think there was a lot of sharing of, of plans and, you know. But I think Rosen Law, you, I don't know if he, you selected those. New Orleans plans for his three models, but they're they're very they're very similar. In fact, one of our older school buildings we found was based on that particular plan. So that's just an answer, I mean, a possible explanation. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. All right, y'all ready for the last push? Mm -hmm. Sure. I guess I'll... <laughs> okay, so. I have three presentation study list applications to present to you. Uh, the first one's for the Brightwood Inn restaurant. Located in eastern Guilford County, the former restaurant is located between Greensboro and Burlington. <clears throat> Situated on US 70, Brightwood Inn gets its name from the O.W. Bright Lodge, which is sadly no more, but was right here. It was a circa 1900 Colonial Revival Tavern and Inn. So this was the setting about 1993. So for the majority of its history, it was constructed in 1936 of load-bearing masonry. This one-story, five-bay building has an asphalt shingle-clad hip roof and a flat roof over the single bay circa 1980 edition. Long a local tradition, or sorry, long a local destination, the Brightwood used to be situated among parcels of farmland as is shown in this 1993 aerial. <laughs> yeah. Collective sigh. Um, now surrounded by commercial development and suburban sprawl, the Brightwood remains a holdout from the first half of the 20th century. The establishment evolved from e with each passing decade, transitioning from a car hop diner to a steakhouse to a truck stop to a juke joint, and finally finding itself as a bistro to keep a pace with other local establishments who served alcoholic beverages. The addition along the original West Elevation became the bar and lounge area. And I'll show that in a few slides here. Um, one longtime employee, Miss Lucille Little, claimed that by the 2010s, the Brightwood was one of the last of its kind along Route 70. So we'll take a spin around the outside. So this is your, facade, your front elevation, your facade, which faces south. Here's just a close up of this is all neon. There's a Texas steer. I'm sure, they serve longhorns every night. Well, they don't anymore, but anyway. Um, I think I think that might say, I, I don't know, I'm not even going to guess. But here's more of the exterior. See the west elevation on the left with a little shed in the back, a little outbuilding for storage, whatnot. The uh, photo on the bottom just shows that kind of recessed bay along the east elevation. And then finally in the upper right is the east elevation. And this is the north or rear elevation. In the middle is the little shed, T-111 siding. And another shot of the, I guess that'd be the northwest elevation. <laughs> So here's a floor plan of the of the Brightwood. 
This would be on the far left, the 1980 edition, which housed the bar slash lounge. Everything else was dining um, or serving um, along with storage. The interior is remarkably intact. Uh, shows the well-preserved interior, including the booth where the king, and I'm gonna ask for responses to who's, who, who, named, who can name the king, uh, when he and his, well, this is a giveaway, he and his band ate at the Brightwood in 1955 or 56. Uh, according to newspaper accounts, Elvis Presley ordered a cheeseburger and a glass of milk. I say that because in staff review, I will, I will not name the staff member who thought the king was Richard Petty. <laughs> so, so, I'm just curious if anyone else would have thought that. Yeah. Thought that. yeah. Exactly that. yeah. yeah. Well, given, the, given the geographic proximity. Okay. Randolph <laughs> True. Yeah. True. Yeah. This is the heart of NASCAR. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, he bellied up uh, when he was a young lad with his, with his uh, <laughs> girlfriend and his bandmates. So there's a little homage to Elvis right here. <laughs> Made newspaper, photos, renderings, you name it. I will stop you right here. Is the nomination based on the fact that Elvis? <laughs> <laughs> it is not, but we'll have t-shirts drawn up that says it, it is. Um, I think that might be it. Well, in addition to its longevity in a highly competitive industry, the Brightwood Inn is known for its famous clientele, including local and state politicians, and of course, the most famous one of all, the king of rock and roll, uh, potentially eligible for the National Register at the local levels of significance under criterion A in the area of commerce. Uh, the proposed period of significance is 1936 to 1974. Uh, the proposed National Register boundary is the tax parcel and uh, staff concurs with the recommendation of state in the application and recommends placement of the Brightwood Inn restaurant on the study list. Jess yes, said this is not operative as a business now, right? Correct. And I don't know. It's preserved. It is. I mean, all of the tongue and groove paneling, the linoleum. Yeah. Um, those, I guess, the top mounted horizontal or the wooden doors. Uh, yeah, it's great. And then you've got the, the 80s bar with its Naga hide notched. Or, uh, <laughs> just, you know, it's it's definitely a step back in time. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, there was a the, the gentleman who owned it for the longest. He actually won the Virginia lottery, but kept on working. Um, but he is he is not the current owner. Okay. okay. okay sure, Any questions? Sure, okay. I think that uh, my yeah, that's just my recommendation screen, but. Yeah. Questions, comments? All right. Next presentation is for the Jack and Leah Tannenbaum House, also known as Tanlia Woods, and I'll get the see if I pronounce that correctly because the study list preparer Cynthia D. Miranda with MDM Consultants is here. It's Just Tanley. Tanley and Lee Tannenbaum. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah, their oldest daughter, her name is Lee Lee Tannenbaum. And Lee was Jack. Well, the wife. Right. So Jean Tannenbaum. Jean. Which also looks like this is Jeannie. So you might want to bring up that too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's, 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 it's well, anyway, I can, I'm getting ahead of myself because it's a really cool property. Um, so it's located in uh, Greens or Guilford County's county uh, seat of local government in Greensboro. And the northwest part, my glasses are so crooked, yeah. golly, um, and the northwest part of town. Uh, it's designed by Greensboro based architect Edward Lowenstein for Dr. and Mrs. Jack Tannenbaum. The modernist, modernist one-story residence was originally on a 10-acre design landscape plan attributed to former UNCGR professor Gregory Avi. So these are just some more context shots to show all the development that's gone on. So that's the original parcel 
in that orange polygon, the red stars over the house. And that's just an overhead shot to kind of show you the basic layout. And then I indicated the driveway. It's kind of circuitous. Um, this is Winwood Drive. And then the drive just kind of meanders back into this deeply wooded great house. A driveway extends from a curb cut on the east side of Winwood Drive near the southwest corner of the polygonal parcel and bends toward the north to reach the dwelling. As is shown in these original Lowenstein blueprints, the southeast facing elevation is considered the facade, but the proximity of the forest growth prevents one from taking in an overall view of that elevation. It is a broad front gabled elevation dominated by a curved window wall with stone columns at one end and a wood clad wall with narrow windows at the other. Exposed steel beams support the roof and a narrow concrete terrace finished with pebbled aggregate stretch edges much of the elevation. Structurally, Tanley Woods is a collection of forms with flat and gabled roofs that sometimes overlap and sometimes do not, leaving gaps where sunlight can illuminate directly and indirectly from above. The gable roof allows for clerestory windows while sliding glass doors and plate glass windows at the interior courtyard create a light well at the center of the dwelling. And this, I found this very useful. Uh, just so I could understand the layout of the interior configuration, but this is a floor plan. And again, this is just kind of a, a shot looking back towards the street. I mean, it's just, you can't see the street during the summer months. And I think it was even a challenge in the winter. I think she said. Well, I haven't been there in the winter, but okay. it would be a challenge. Yeah. yeah. But this is the, you know, it's this is what's the recent growth or recent you know, suburban development. <clears throat> so the driveway that provides access to the house terminates at the southmost corner of the dwelling at a carport in the south half of the southwest elevation. The other end of that elevation, elevation is an exterior wall with stone face skirting under vertical wood sheathing pierced by two window bays. A recess entrance to the right provides e ingress and egress for the family. Mailboxes, also designed by the architect, stand between this entrance and the left side of the carport. So the, the photo on the left is the family entrance. The photo on the right is the, considered the main entrance. And that, there, that um, sorry, the covered walkway is in the middle. The carport, along the right side of the carport, is a covered walk leading to the main entry. The carport and the walkway both are paved with concrete slabs with pebbled aggregate, like that of the terrace across the facade. The landing in front of the door also features this treatment, and the slab continues along the remaining portion of the southwest elevation to meet the terrace at the facade. The main entry cons consists of a single-leaf wood door, a wide side light and section of stone clad wall with tall and slender fixed sash windows. These finishes are repeated all around the house, wood, stone, glazing, as well as broad and narrow window openings, as well as blind walls. So this is actually the facade. Again, those really tall stone support structures and the window wall and then the steel beams here. And it's just the juxtaposition next to all the, the vegetation. It's just very harmonious. So next we're gonna go just basically look at the exterior of the house. Uh, this is the swimming pool and cabana. These are the, this is the cabana with the doors were open. So it reveals this little bar here with some funky seating. And this is a bedroom. I think the kid, one of the kids, maybe the boy's bedroom. But again, I mean, the use of stone, the wood, the aggregate around the pool deck, it's all repeated, but 
it just lends that sense of the man-made and the natural, you know, harmonizing together to create a great aesthetic. So now we'll go inside. The interior is dramatic and open, and the design aesthetic repeats the same materials that Lowenstein used on the exterior. From the small entrance foyer, one can simultaneously take in the glass-walled center courtyard that functions as both a light well and an art piece. The dramatic curved stone wall in the living room that anchors the hearth and its copper-clad hood, and the crescent-shaped sectional sofa designed to complement the concave wall and to embrace the warmth and glow from the hearth. So again, this is just some additional shots of the living room. This is the library. Another one of Lowenstein's, um, he used cabinetry, a lot of built-ins, which is evident here, hiding the modern fixtures like a television. And this is the dining room. And this is a, so this is the courtyard out here, but this is the hallway. This is the bar, but the bar is concealed behind those little Dolce little doors. So the square courtyard features glass walls with sliding glass doors, wall panels clad in vertical wood siding and inter interspersed with tall, narrow, fixed sash windows and large, fixed sash picture windows over wood-sided walls. In place of a floor, concrete panels overlap each other to form a path through the space and over reflecting pools below. In their layered arrangement, the courtyard panels echo the overlapping flat roofs of the surrounding forms of the house. The outdoor space is completely enclosed by the various zoned living areas of the house. Although I did not include photos of the bedrooms in the presentation, um, bedrooms provide access through sliding glass doors into the center courtyard, as well as to a palace in the swimming pool, which we saw in a couple slides before. The house has been changed very little since its original construction. Well, that's all. Uh, I still have some more to, I still have some more to say. Um, Lowenstein's firm designed a large number of houses, as well as other property types, in Greensboro and elsewhere in the 1950s and 60s. Although not all of them were modernist, several notable houses were excellent renditions of the human strain of mid-20th century modernism that was heavily influenced by the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. The Tannenbaum's house shows extensive refinement of ideas of controlling light, providing storage integrated to the structure of the house and the organization of space for various family members' needs that was initially seen in the National Register listed Wilbur and Martha Carter House, also in Greensboro, uh, his first modernist design identified in Greensboro. It also includes a number of elements strongly associated with his work, including the use of natural materials at the interior and exterior, curving interior walls, and dramatic windows and hearths. Uh, the application recommended that the um, that Tanley, Tan, Tanley Woods is potentially eligible for inclusion in the National Register under Criterion C in the area of architecture and the embodiment, embodiment of the modernist design. The house retains all seven aspects of integrity. It remains its original location. And while the exact initial landscape plan has not been located or well maintained, the house is always meant to stand amidst the Piedmont forest of the wooded lot where it was built. Its setting, therefore, is basically intact. The very few changes made to the house have, have kept intact the integrity of design, materials, and workmanship. The house continues to function as a dwelling and remains in the Tannenbaum family, retaining its integrity of feeling and association. Uh, the proposed period of significance is 1962, the year of construction. The, national, the proposed National Register boundary is the current tax parcel, as it is the land historically associated with the home. Staff concurs with this assessment and recommends placement on the study list. Sean, is this um, by chance connected to Sig and Baum in Greensboro? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, there is a family connection. Yes, I, I actually 
they were very active. I and mean, I've been in that home that was fundraiser. So it's that they were very, very active. It's great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't hide. I don't hide. I don't hide. I don't want to hex that because I yeah. said something about the name of and then that's the <laughs> one. And then you create an issue. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank Cynthia for attending and adding your, adding your contribution. It was a great application. So finally, we have the Lanes Chapel Methodist Church and Cemetery. Um, I will say that this was um, a study list application was presented in 2000 uh, for this property. Um, at the time, staff did not recommend that the church be placed on the study list, but that the cemetery uh, was because of the artistic detail shown in the headstones. So at present, the cemetery is study listed, but the church is not. But um, nothing's been done. I mean, it's just kind of sat there for, 20, for the past 23 years. Um, but anyway, with all that said, um, this is Lane's Chapel, again, Methodist Church and Cemetery, located in uh, Montgomery County, seen in blue. Tucked in the northwest corner of Montgomery County, Lane's Chapel Methodist Church and Cemetery epitomizes the highly rural character of most of Montgomery County, despite the fact that today the property is near some of the recreational developed development associated with Baden Lake. Helping to retain its isolated setting, a roughly paved road, not too many years ago, just gravel, leads southeast from Uwari Point Parkway to the church and cemetery and stops just beyond them, no longer continuing onward to wh wherever it once may have gone. The drive along Lane's Chapel Road, State Route 1162 from Uwari Point Parkway is flanked by high brush and woods, increasing the isolated feel of the place. So here again, here's just some general locational slides. The red star. indicating it's right there on the shoreline, basically. Although the church and cemetery are part of a single parcel, the church and its accompanying outbuildings stand on the south side of Lane's Chapel Road, while the cemetery stretches out across the north side of the road. So Lane's Chapel is characteristic of many simple country churches built during the second half of the 19th century, many of which do not survive. These churches tended to be, tended to be weatherboard clad frame structures, as was Lane's Chapel originally, but it was brick veneered in a misguided effort to preserve the building in 1966 to 67, which is more than 50 years ago. Still, Lane's Chapel's form and most of its details, and certainly its interior, remain true to the type. Although the church's date of construction is not entirely certain, original physical details yield a late 19th century date of construction. Here is the chapel for the church. So Lane's Chapel measures 31 feet wide by 50 feet deep with a front gable roof, roof sheathed with 5 feet metal. It is brick veneered and running bond and along the bottom of each side wall, Vents are created by four spaced vertical bricks. The utilitarian facade has two double leaf paneled entrances, one originally for men and one for women. Two brick steps rise to each door with a granite sill directly beneath the door. Four 12 over 12 sash windows line each side elevation, while two additional windows are on the rear. A brick stove flue rises near the rear of the church on the southeast elevation. At the rear of the church, a small wooden door opens to allow a view of the church's structural supports, hefty log joists running crosswise beneath the building. Other alterations that occurred during the 1966-67 preservation effort include a loss of the gable returns and a wide freeze board, and the church installed rectangular wooden ventilators in the gable peaks at that time. And this is the interior. 
The interior arrangement remains unchanged from the church building's inception. The two front doors open to a single room with 14 feet high ceilings. The floor, walls, and ceiling are all sheathed with six inch tongue and groove painted pine boards installed with cut nails. Austere, plain wood pews with a slanted back and a closure board at each end are divided into three sets by two aisles. A box center plate runs from front to rear down the center of the church, supporting the ceiling. Supporting the plate are three box posts, two of which have a bracket for holding a candle or oil lamp. The church has never been electrified. Most illumination has always been provided by the vast amount of light provided through the many large windows. However, heat has been more of a problem. After the church was brick veneered and the brick brick flue was built, a wood stove was placed at the southeast side of the church near the spring until near the rear until the spring of 2022 when the church was vandalized and the stove was stolen. At the rear, you see in the bottom left photo there, at the rear southwest end of the church, a, lo a low U-shaped platform outlined with a balustrade with turned balusters and a hefty turned newel at each open end of the U identifies the pulpit area. Set back within the U, a, a panel pulpit stands atop a second low platform. Behind it, a pew runs from one end of the pl pulpit platform to the other. It is like the it is like the other pews in the church, except that its end closure boards are paneled. And I challenge you to say pulpit platform. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so sharing the south side. Uh, what happened? I might have a slide out of order. Oh, well, maybe I got to add a, okay. But it's nothing too exciting, but sharing the south side of Lane's Chapel Road are several outbuildings and structures, including a picnic shelter that dates to the late 1960s, uh, two circa 1990 privies, a church sign, as well as a well. These next group of slides are just basically an overview of the cemetery. And to say it's sprawling is an understatement. These are some of the more notable and earlier stones, all of the Naylor family, and all manner of material were used. And these are two family plots. And these are just some examples of more period, I think I think the in the bottom left, this is a Confederate soldier uh, monument. I think this may have been, I don't think this was the last interment because it was it, the, the last burial took place in 2005. At any rate, Pearlie had a lot of children. Let's leave it at that. Uh, the cemetery stretches out across Lane's Chapel Road uh, from the church. The gravestones, numbering approximately 475 in total, include 252 that are inscribed or on which inscriptions or partial inscri inscriptions can still be read. The stones are oriented largely from southeast to northwest. The oldest cluster of gravestones, gravestones appears to be in the southeast section nearest the church but 19th century stones can be seen throughout the cemetery. Inscriptions have worn off many stones, making it difficult to date those. The cemetery exhibits a scattered collection of approximately 252 inscribed gravestones from decades beginning in 1850 and running up through the first decade of the 21st century. There are 86 marked stones prior to 1900, including one from the 1820s, two from the 1830s, three each from the 1850s and 1860s, nine from the 1870s, 25 from the 1880s, and 43 from the 1890s. After 1900, there are 103 interments between 1900 and 1930, 24 between 1931 and 1950, 18 between 1951 and 2000, and the last two in 2001 and 2005. From this, it can be seen that the gravestones increased during the second half of the 19th century, 
not including unmarked stones. And that in the 20th century, the years between 1900 and 1930 had the most burials with the numbers diminishing rapidly after that. The gravestones general, generally reflect those periods and their materials, design and craftsmanship. Okay, and it was here somewhere. So here's the, here's the picnic shelter. See, that's worth seeing, right? And here's the privies. So obviously this, again, like Beth's church, no indoor plumbing. So a little bit of history about the church. Uh, the records of the Methodist Conference provide more information about Lane's Chapel that helped flesh out the picture of this country church in Northwest Montgomery County. The church register for the Jackson Hill Circuit between 1883 and 1913 gives the names of 16 pastors who had one, two, three, and four-year appointments to serve the churches in the circuit, including Lane's Chapel. Between 1884 and 1914, there were 244 members of Lane's Chapel Church, a goodly number for a rural congregation, and 22 baptisms were performed between 1888 and 1899. There were usually, uh, let's see, up until the early 1920s, the minute books of the quarterly conference meetings reveal the active role that Lane's Chapel Church played within the circuit. The three particular areas of reporting for Lane's Chapel, as well as for other churches, were the site of the quarterly conferences, the money the various churches contributed to the conference, and the progress or lack thereof of Sunday or Sabbath schools. Newspaper accounts also inform us of community activities held at Lane's Chapel. In September 1909, the Farmers Union was scheduled to hold a picnic at Lane's Chapel to which everyone was to bring provisions such as beef, mutton, turkey, and chicken. In October, in October 1912, political candidates from Montgomery County, as well as the state legislature, gave campaign speeches at Lane's Chapel. In March 1914, the Bombay Council 314 of the Junior Order of United American Mechanics selected Lane's Chapel as the location for their annual service. Together, these newspaper notices give an impression of the past role of Lane's Chapel in this section of Montgomery County. As Lane's Chapel was continuing to develop its prominent place among the people of northwestern Montgomery County in the early 20th century, a series of events transpired that ultimately had a disastrous effect on the community associated with Lane's Chapel. Only a few miles west of Lane's Chapel, the Narrows of the Atkin River became the site of an ambitious plan for regional development in North Carolina's Piedmont that centered on hydroelectric power. In the summer of 1917, the Narrows Dam, 216 feet high and over 1,600 feet long, was completed. It created a reservoir, Bowden Lake, of Baden Lake, of over 5,300 acres with a shoreline of 115 miles. For many, the hydroelectric dam and the positive impact it had on the economy of much of the region, as well as the eventual recreational impact of Baden Lake, cannot be overstated. At the same time, the damming of the river had a negative impact on Lane's Chapel community that must be considered. In 1916, the Methodist circuits were revised and Lane's Chapel became part of the New Hope Circuit. The minutes of the quarterly conference of the New Hope Circuit reflect the gradual demise of Lane's Chapel in the early 1920s. During the first two quarters of 1920-21, Lane's Chapel was still contributing money to the circuit. By the end of 1921, Lane's Chapel no longer sponsored a Sunday school. Financial contributions from Lane's Chapel also became sporadic by 1921. In the first, for the first quarter of 1923-24, Lane's Chapel was still listed in the minutes of the circuit's quarterly meeting, but thereafter, nothing was said or listed about Lane's Chapel, and it simply disappeared from conference records. In the 1920s, the surviving congregation began holding homecoming at the church on the second Sunday of September annually. Collections raised at the homecomings helped to maintain the church and cemetery, and in the early 1970s, a committee was appointed to raise an endowment fund for the perpetual care of the cemetery. As part of the general effort to maintain the church and cemetery, in the mid 60s, the exterior of the weather, weatherboard church was brick veneered in an ill advised effort to preserve it. Brick veneering was popular in the mid 20th century for new construction and was often used to update earlier frame buildings. 
Although the addition of brick veneer at Lane's Chapel, accompanied by the removal of the eaves cornice returns, changed some of the original character of the exterior of the building, the overall simple form with its gable front roof, two front entrances, and 12 over 12 sash windows, allow the little church to retain a strong sense of its original exterior character. Okay, after the homecoming celebrations were started, a small group of people eventually began holding an afternoon service at Lane's Chapel on the last Sunday of the month. Various retired and lay preachers served freely on a regular basis at Lane's Chapel for years. By the early 1980s, only around eight to 10 worshipers of retirement age remained in attendance at the Sunday afternoon services. And after 2000, the Sunday afternoon services ceased as the few remaining attendees had died. However, the September homecomings continue for all those who have, who have longtime connections with Lane's Chapel and the church, cemetery, and grounds continue to be maintained. Uh, the applicant recommends the following. Lane's Chapel Church and Cemetery is potentially eligible for the National Register under Criterion A for social history and Criterion C for art, artistic value, architecture, and the embodiment of a property type and form. The proposed period of significance is circa 1825, which corresponds to the oldest burial in the cemetery to 1974, uh, which is the cutoff. Uh, the, the church uh, Sunday afternoon service is the homecomings continued up through that date. So, um, and the cemetery itself was active until 2005, but <laughs> not exceptionally significant, at least is what we know now. The proposed National Register boundary is the current tax parcel. So, questions? Yeah, was the um, omission of the church to, because of the, at the time, 2000, the brick facade, the brick facade, that is basically yeah. happening? Yeah. Uh, technically. They, I guess they thought it was to its detriment and it, no, it just, you know, was the death knell, so to speak. Now, it's 50 years. <laughs> now that technique has become, I mean, I, I did a, submitted an inquiry to the National Register Coordinators Listserv, and it's a very popular treatment um, to give a sense of stability and permanence, more so than frame. Um, I mean, I think it's still there. I, I you know, I mean, injecting my <laughs> personal opinion, but, um, but you know, it's, I'm not so bothered by it because of the interior is it's it's yeah it's unchanged so i think it has more going for it than it does in its steps. but but yeah that was there was no period of significance established or anything in the original or proposed in the original application so and so staff congruence with the application's recommendation i do all right we have the Central and Southeastern uh, regions. The first one, uh, no. The restaurant, yes. The house, yes. And the church, yes. Okay. I hear a motion. Motion to accept staff recommendations. What? Motion to accept staff recommendations for all of them. Is there a second? All okay. right. Are you ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. I appreciate your diligence today, and we're going to get out an hour before four o'clock. Thank you. Want. We appreciate all of y'all's hard work and all these. I'll be sure that you fill out the the. Paperwork before you leave. Um, and uh, do not forget that you have another meeting that uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson will be presiding on by Zoom on the 19th. That was interesting. Uh, she's setting this that they need to be presented. Like or some surveys. Survey. 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 Okay. Survey. Okay. What's the yeah. DNS surveys and the results? Um, and I don't remember if we need a motion to adjourn, but y'all are free to go. <laughs> <laughs>
as if I held, held you hostage as uh, Thank <laughs> you.